So, let me tell you something that you should have already realized by now about this fucking show you're listening to. This shit is supposed to be for mature audiences. As in grown-ups, mentally mature. It's supposed to talk about adult subjects, an adult frame of mind. It's not fucking that at all. This is two emotionally regressed, broken half-wits pretending to offer insight on movies. All they really offer you is an endless sexual perversion and a laundry list of personal paraphilia issues. You can make your own choices in life, but you have to choose this as entertainment. You know you're better than this. You have to know you are better than listening to Cinema Psyops. Sixth consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host, Court, a guy that is super stoked to have podcasting royalty in the house with him tonight with my co-host, Ricky. Hey, what's going on, man? It, whatever, man. You, you're, you're the king. I'm just sitting close to the throne, taking it all in. <laughs> no, no, we'll be like we'll be like Mercia and Umbria, where uh, we're kingdoms <laughs> that with two different, you know, two different kings, but like we work in conjunction to protect each other's interests. That's that's all. That's cool. Oh. yeah, everybody's a king in Cinema Psyops land. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ricky, are you doing everything under the Helming banner kind of now, and you're just kind of doing mm-hmm. different things? How is how's your show going, and what it is that you're you're actually doing for the folks? Well, we kind of revamped the show. I mean, we had about 80 episodes under our belt and took a break. And actually, you remember I was actually going to retire from podcasting and Danny twisted my arm and said, no, man, we need to get back to the basics. And I'm glad we did. Yeah. Thanks for that, Danny, because we need Ricky and you back on the air. And we're just we're really, really enjoying working together again. He's he's got a busy schedule, so we're making it work. So what we have done, because our shows run 
you know, an hour long each each episode. We uh, decided to fill the gap because we can only record bi-weekly. So the three of us are kind of doing solo projects as well. And it's all under the Helming moniker. So all that stuff is posted in our Facebook and all that stuff as well. But we're doing, uh, Mark's got a show called Mongo Mini Bites, where he reviews his own acquired taste of movies, which his slogan is some movies are just better in small doses. So, uh, and he's right. He just covered Santa Slay. And it's hilarious. <laughs> it was, it's a great episode. Then you I got just my show. Watched that actually um, for Christmas for the first time this last Christmas during the yeah. pandemic, and um, I loved it for all the wrong reasons that everybody else is hating it. Yeah. And I mean, his review of it is absolutely correct and spot on. And he just keeps bringing up the fact of how did they get all these people in this movie? I mean, <laughs> you know, obviously you didn't spend the money on the movie. So I guess it's just the fact of getting these people in it. So I don't know. He, I think it was a great, great episode. And I know he's got a ton ready to go. I've kind of started my own thing, which is Dr. Movie MR, which is actually kind of, I kind of ripped that from Dr. Butcher MD, believe it or Medical not. Medical Deviant. Yeah. So I even kind of took, you know, the the letter scheme and tried to try to copy it a little bit. But that's kind of where the name came from. And, you know, first episode covered Contamination. I'm planning on doing a lot of Fulci stuff, a lot of Argento stuff. This, a lot of stuff that's not going to make it on Hell Mean, because Danny is a little pickier than I am when it comes to movie watching. <laughs> he has taste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's it. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, we're excited that you know everything's going really well over there, and and just it's fun to be back and kind of back home because it, it felt like we just kind of went off in our own ways a little bit and. I get bored pretty easy, so it just made sense to start doing something. If I was going to do any kind of solo thing and just keep it part of Helming, and that should have been the move I did to begin with, but, you know, second time around, you you do it the right way. Well, also, you're so amazing at coming up with show names and ideas for shows that you just throw a bunch of stuff <laughs> out there and then see what sticks and what, what you like doing and everything like that. And just the wellspring of creativity that you come up with is always incredible. But man, I am super geared up. I could not think of anybody else that I wanted to talk about an insane Fulci movie with other than you, oh. because you get just as excited as I do about this crap. Oh, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, I'm so excited to get to, to get to get together with you here on, and just talk to my favorite podcaster. But oh. I get I get to talk about Fulci, and that, <laughs> that's the the super exciting part. Is there is nothing like a Fulci movie. I, I don't care. You've got all these knockoff guys that that do the the Italian cinema thing, but Fulci is just its own thing, and I love it. <laughs> it goes so beyond the realm of any rational thought or even taste in some cases. To the point where you are dumbfounded and somewhat accosted by his films, particularly in this era of Fulci in the 90s. Oh, it's, yeah. it's not that he didn't give up. It's just that he was like, fuck you, figure it out on your own by this point. Exactly. And, and it's so fucking fun and confounding and frustrating. And the only one that I can think of that is even more confusing and upsetting to me than this is this film, Enigma, that we're talking about tonight, is probably Cat in the Brain. <laughs> Oh, man, Cat in the Brain is, whoo, yeah, there, there's no logic to that one whatsoever. It's like four pieces of different movies you just threw together and said, you think it's confusion? Yeah, it is. You figure it out. <laughs> yeah, this Enigma is kind of like, let's take uh, pieces of Suspiria, pieces of Phenomena, mm -hmm. pieces of Carrie, and then pieces of the ripoff Carrie movie Jennifer, throw it into a giant blender, and then dump it out onto celluloid, and that's what this film is. And it, it's all in there, and more. It's so yep. insane. I can't believe the shit he packed into this film. Hey, don't forget Patrick, either. It's definitely got a big Patrick oh, feel yeah. to it. Yeah, huge with the coma, huge Patrick vibe. Good call yeah. on that. I'm 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 remiss for not mentioning Patrick. Absolutely. Patrick <sighs> terrified me as a kid, man. <laughs> Was that like Australian, right? Or Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, it's 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 a New Zealand or Australian. I'm pretty sure it was Australian, but yeah. Patrick is a really trippy film because of somebody being in a coma and being able to basically astral project, right? That's right. kind of what yeah. we're seeing happen here in Enigma too. Absolutely. We're giving away we're giving away the plot, but <laughs> 
<laughs> That's the show, folks. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> oh, if only it were that quick. No, no. Uh, I would like to just let everybody know right now before we just dive into it, because obviously, Ricky, we're both itching to get talking about this film hardcore here. So uh, before yeah. we actually dive into it, uh, everyone that is now currently listening to the Pirate Radio Edit, which means you too, Ricky. So we'll be talking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I am going to be playing two versions of a song titled Head Over Heels. For the Pirate Radio Edit, you get Tears for Fears. For those of you that are on the main feed, <laughs> you will actually get the Head Over Heels song that was featured in Enigma. And that's going to happen right, right after this fucking promo. This will keep you quiet. Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me Cutting a New Show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also, yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs, costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com, or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, Back to the cutting room. Put on your makeup, your eyes are blue enough. Tonight is special for you. You're gonna see that. in that fucking song man tears oh, for yeah. fears Great. knew how to write a fucking song <laughs> yeah. oh man i'll tell you that really really grabs you now the head over heels that was done for the film does have a hook and does kind of talk about the same thing about falling so madly in love and that's kind of how the film actually starts now there is a trailer for it but it's all sound effects and uh scream shots and things that are not usable so we're just gonna get right into the film <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first 20 minutes, the movie opens on a shot of a boarding school in an old-timey black-and-white style photograph, which makes me think of The Shining. And then we see yep. the actual school in live action as the camera whips around. The opening credits start as we see a boy and girl helping a another girl get ready for what appears to be a date, where... <laughs> Sir, a.k.a. Fred, puts the moves on Kathy in the most unromantic parking situation since Marty almost banged his mom. <laughs> yeah, man, when you break out the golden eyeshadow, you know it's a special night. <laughs> that sequence, I feel like, could have been set to, like, um, some kind of, like, Van Halen-type song so perfectly and would have totally been, not necessarily a John Hughes movie, but, like, that kind of 80s movie where they were approaching yep. John Hughes, like, uh, something wild or something along those lines. Right. You know, like like that kind of adjacent to John Hughes, but not quite there. It felt very much like that. 
And uh, I don't think it, Fulci was trying to make an 80s teen horror comedy, but he fucking nailed it if he was. <laughs> yeah, it, it almost looks like an episode of like Growing Pains or something. I mean, it's it's a sequence that you would see in almost TV of the time, you know. Oh, right. nope, this color don't work. And they're shaking their heads. No, you know, like, oh, you... <laughs> you pick that again. Right. Silly me. And some of us are sitting here going, oh, my God, what did we get ourselves and Ricky into? Oh, no. <laughs> what have I done? But no, it's not the case. We actually do get the horror later on. So it turns out this was a setup right from the start. So Fred actually overplays his hand and gets real forceful and pretty rapey. But then he, it, yeah. it's revealed once she actually starts getting into it that he was actually part of this and he was pretending to like her just so everyone else could make a horrible prank and bully her. They pull all the cars around and surround this vehicle and are like hidden just behind the trees, turn on all their headlights and just shine it in there and then they all start pointing and laughing and then they chase her out she's running away with fucking cars chasing her what a bunch of yeah. fucking assholes and the amount of people that's in on this prank is is just unreal it's like obviously they don't have anything else to do maybe they're not fans of miami vice or whatever but hey let's just go out and listen to this girl's private conversation with a guy that sounds like fun well, not only that, they're perfectly setting her up to be so vulnerable and reveal like some of her oh, yeah. desires, and they make fun of her for it. Like they repeat it after her saying it, and then they're like chanting it at her when they're chasing her, and it's just unbelievably humiliating. And the worst part yeah. is they just start chasing her, driving their cars while she's just on foot running. So there's no way she's ever <laughs> going to escape them, no matter what. And they will not stop tormenting or laughing at this poor girl until she is basically chased out into the middle of the road and hit by a fucking car. Yeah. Then they kind of go, oh, maybe we ought to back off. <laughs> yeah. Now they realize the horrible, horrible nature of such a prank. Uh, but then yeah. they cut from that to see that she's now in some kind of a super sci-fi coma is what I have written in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say <laughs> this whole scene in the hospital, you know, I, I got to say right off the bat, worst nurse ever. Right. I mean, <laughs> she's sitting there and watching her just red line and doesn't react. <laughs> it's like, you know, you went to school for this. You're supposed to say, hey, uh, something's wrong. But yeah, that never happens. And, you know, we we hear a lot about how bad the health system is now in America. But holy shit. <laughs> this is pretty bad. Yeah, this is the type of healthcare that you would expect to get in like a less than third world country. Like this is pretty bad. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think what they're trying to illustrate here is just how careless and like, you know, no one seems to really be anywhere affected by anything horrible happening to this girl, maybe. Or just the idea is that she dies so that she can astral project so but her heart stops. And then she has until they yeah. bring her back from flatlining. I it's so hard to tell because he doesn't stick with that. Then her heartbeat goes crazy, but her brain activity is dead. You know, like they <laughs> switch it back and forth they can't decide what they want it to be and that's true that's what happens in the movie we just have to like acknowledge that that does yeah yeah not, not only worst nurse ever but the doc is pretty much the worst doctor i've ever seen either hey any anything to, let me know if you hear anything different <laughs> what really right. nurse you do my job for me because i am supposed to monitor this patient's well-being the worst part about this though is the tubes and various pieces of electronic equipment that are sticking out of her head and face they do not look in any way shape or form medical medical at all. This is 100% yeah. completely <laughs> inaccurate. And there is no way that they are going to make me believe that that is actually a true hospital. Like it's so fucking <laughs> fake and you just have to kind of go with it. That's Fulci, man. I mean, again, you, you just pretty much nailed the description of every Fulci movie just then. Not everyone, man. <laughs> Some of his earliest stuff when he had a really good effects crew was awesome. But like this, this just does not cut the mustard. This is more like fucking <laughs> Bruno Mattei level of shit. And this is what we get for Fulci in the 90s. Like I said, it's not that he gave right. up. It's just that he's not interested in those details anymore. He just wants to that's do true. something different and weird. Like, that's it. That's all he cared about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking and of weird, how about after she pretty much red lines and then all of a sudden the camera backs up and it turns into the opening of the HBO feature presentation, <laughs> you know, do, 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 where the camera goes through the street and up into the sky. I mean, it's just like the opening to HBO. <laughs> yeah. Is that supposed to be, that's supposed to be like her spirit. It's leaving the body and yeah. it's coming up out. And then it, it goes over to the school. And just as she's like dying there and redlining, then a girl pulls up to the school and then they do this weird cut back and forth to show her Kathy. <laughs> and then Ava, Kathy, 
Ava, Kathy, Ava, Kathy, Ava, back and forth. And then they, we just stay with Ava and then she goes into the school. This is before we even know her name. But like, that's how, right. that that's kind of how that goes, you know? And you do hear yeah. some dialogue from the spirit. Like, it's actually Kathy saying she's not ready to die. Um, she can't believe that this is happening to her. And all that stuff does kind of happen in like an extreme slow motion. And it's really kind of bizarre, you know, and they're obviously yep. just trying to show that our victim and this new girl are the same person, whether it, yeah. and, and the movie doesn't really know whether Kathy is actually embodied as Ava for like a tulpa of vengeance, or if Ava is an actual girl that Kathy is possessing. The film can't decide which it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's up for grabs, man. I mean, I even got, you know, when she walks up to the school, I'm like, and Susan. Susie Banyan makes her way to the German school of right, dance. I mean, it's right. yeah, like I'm you said, it feels so much Suspiria like Suspiria. Vibes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? We're actually at our very first clip for the night. Back in your room, girl. This isn't a circus. It is not our normal practice to accept new students halfway through the school year, Miss Gordon. You are an exception. We decided to relax the rules in your case, not only out of respect for your family's name and your father's position, but also because of the nature of your illness. I had a breakdown, Miss Jones, a mild nervous breakdown, and now I'm over it completely. Who's smoking? You know it's forbidden in here. Get rid of that cigarette at once, and don't let me catch you at it again. And that goes for you, too. I didn't do anything. <laughs> and get back in your room. Both I'm sorry this sale's taken, dear. Oh, how awful. Miss Gordon, that is not your room. Let me see. I knew it. I won't have you encouraging all the other girls to smoke. Your room's down there. Miss Gordon, this is Miss Clark. She's your roommate. Miss Gordon is the newest pupil in the college. I hope you'll become friends. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Miss Gordon, I want to wish you a very successful year. <sighs> Thank God she's gone. I'm Eva. What's your first name? Jennifer. Hmm. <sighs> okay, Jenny. Let's get one thing straight. For me, a successful year means making out with as many gorgeous boys as possible. <laughs> and with that, we see the uh, ever so wonderful aerobics class where all of the girls are gyrating their hips at a fully grown man who is acting extremely inappropriately at them as this is happening in the <laughs> aerobics class and we realize immediately the instructor is actually the guy Fred from the prank as well and apparently all these ladies think that he is like some hot slice of man meat it's like they've never seen a guy before when he's around you know it's it's funny you say that because the very next line I got is about Eva and it says this lady is a slice of Italian hotness man <laughs> she is gorgeous <laughs> to me you know she kind of reminds me of the girl who was in Rolling Thunder. A little bit, yeah, yeah. I can't remember who it was that she was reminding me of, but uh, it was one of the Italian giallos that I had seen. It was yeah. um, at some point, um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was like a victim in one of those giallos that I can remember, and I thought that it might be her, but I never looked it up. But yeah, she has this very stunning, very striking look to yeah. her. And I think they chose her that way on purpose because they needed someone that almost has an attractive look look to the point where it feels unnatural and not right because you want to be unnerved right. by her. Well, she's wanting to seduce people, too. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of being able to get in here and, and you know, here's, here's a girl that was overlooked when she was alive. 
if you want to put it that way. And now she's using this attractiveness to, you know, get her will completed. So. Right. I mean, if you if you don't make this a revenge plot, if you make it to where what we're seeing is her coming back to Earth and then literally coming back to Earth in a new body so that she can feel like what it's like to be hot and be cool. And, yeah. you know, everybody Why wants not to this be with one? her. <laughs> right. Like that is such an 80s fucking movie plot line. Oh, yeah. But what Fulton well, does is just kind of subvert it and turn it into a horror film because it's Carrie. She's doing it for Carrie. Sure. Yeah. I like that she says her goal is to make out as many hot guys as possible. And I'm going, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm thinking in my mind is, so I'm just hoping at that time I was there. If I was there, I was hot to her. Then I think I'll yeah. be good. Yeah. Uh, we do need to talk about the inappropriate touching the instructor does, too. He slaps yeah. one of his students' asses and tells her that she's a fat ass. That yeah. was horrendous. But then she turns around and tells him herself, hey, you do that again, I'm going to be slapping back. <laughs> yeah, but that is like fireable, man. You do not be laying hands on children in your class, let alone in such a sexual manner, man. That's super inappropriate. I mean, well, I know it's a, it's an all really ladies boarding school. Really, are, are there kids, right? Yeah. They're not adults. Well, they're they're t they're possibly in their 20s, I would think. And I would think he's not far from it because he was involved with the prank the first time around. And this is not a big different space of time here this is all kind of the same time frame all right well if they're in their 20s then that's okay yeah but it's still sexual harassment and wrong you don't put your hands on someone oh, unless yeah. they want you to right <laughs> and then he goes right from that calling that one lady a fat ass and basically being shot down to coming right on to ava and ava just basically senses it like she senses him well, like, catching her in her radar in his radar yeah well she even does the i pulled a hammy thing right to, to get his attention so right once she walks away from the initial like introduction then she does do that where she um pretends like she's getting a cramp so that he'll rub her leg and then they cut away from that to ava putting on her underwear so thank you for that movie yeah <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if you noticed or not, but I, I know Fauci's trying to make this Americana by the things that are in the room and stuff. But did you notice the Yoda poster on the wall? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then there was Top Gun in one of the other rooms. The Top yeah. Gun, I believe. But I don't know if teenage right. girls would really give too much of a shit about There's even Yoda. a song about it, I think. You know, counting Yoders on the wall. That don't bother <laughs> me at all. <laughs> We're going to get a copyright strike on the main feed if you keep that up. <laughs> Yeah, man, I just thought, yeah, I know what he was going for here, but there's not a chance in the 80s that a group of sorority girls or whatever they are here would have a poster of Yoda on the wall. It's just, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. That's, that's just believable as the rest of this movie. That's pretty slim, yeah. And it turns out that Ava's actually getting ready for her date. She's going to go see the instructor guy. And yeah. her roommate does try to warn her off. She basically says that he's going to rape you unless you actually want to have sex with him. Don't go. Like, that's basically what she's hinting at. Yeah, pretty much. And it even cuts back to, to him in a studio. It's not like he's hanging out at, in a in a a bedroom or something. He's in the studio making sure he's got his little couch over there ready to go. And you got Scary Mary, quite contrary over here. And she's pissed off because Stud Muffins kept her mop bucket. Wow. I mean, it's just the way this movie jumps. It's just like, hold on. Let me get my senses back before we jump to this next scene. <laughs> yeah, well, Ava's not concerned about the unhealthy reputation that the guy has as, anyway, so she's oh, on no. her way there. But I think the scene where he's like flexing and prepping and then basically yeah. just throws Mary right out, I think it's because yeah. he's trying to like, he's psyching himself up and he's trying to like look at himself and he's all vain and we're just trying to see how much of a prick he is. And he throws Mary out and then as he's shoving her out the door because she's going to interrupt his sex date, he actually then scolds her for leaving her fucking bucket, right? And he yeah. yells at her for throwing her out the door before she can even take the bucket because she probably <laughs> would have taken the fucking bucket all right and then yeah I, I used to work for a guy like this man he would look at himself in the mirror all the time when he'd walk by cars he would look at himself in the reflection he wore shoes that were like four times too big for his feet and they would flap whenever he took a step we called him clown shoe <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. The, the interesting part about this, just to kind of bring it back to the movie, right after he shoves her out the door and you were talking about how she comes back and she starts staring at him. It's I don't think yeah. she's pissed about the bucket because her eyes turn red as if she's possessed. <laughs> it's either, OK. She's either possessed by a demon or we just jumped right into the end of Ozzy's Ultimate Sin video. I can't tell which. <laughs> it is the ultimate sin. Yeah, man. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that, that joke was totally a setup for you because I knew we were podcasting together. You're welcome. <laughs> 
uh, I was thinking, actually, Queen's Rack had a video called uh, Want to Get Close to You, where he's a vampire, and they had a lot of the red eyes just like this in it. So that's kind of what I thought of. But it's not as well known as Ultimate Sin or Shot in the Dark or whichever one it was. I thought it was Ultimate Sin. Where is it? No, it's on Ultimate Sin, but it's a Shot in the Dark it's, is the video shot in the on dark. the Ultimate yeah. Sin album. Yeah, you can take my Aussie fan card. Go right ahead. <laughs> Hey, at least you knew Ultimate Sin. That's good enough. <laughs> All right. So we're back with the aerobics instructor, still staring at his reflection. He's admiring himself. <laughs> and he basically goes all full narcissist. And then he sees that the image changes. And he actually sees himself trying to push his way out of the other side of the mirror. And while the effect doesn't look super believable, the execution of it and the way the actor's trying to sell it actually does kind of make it a little creepy. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah, we, yeah, we can tell it's just some Reynolds right out, you know, or some, you know, whatever it is they're using. Here's some cellophane, some glad wrap. They did have some pieces that looked like actual hard edged lines where like the glass was stretching, but it was also starting to crack um, that I think they did really, really well. Even though that's still made of look like the plastic wrap laying over his head, um, there were still some lines that were in it to where it looked like cracks were starting to form. And so when it actually does explode, it it does look believable. It's kind of cool. You got that Evil Dead 2 thing, you know, where he jumps out of the mirror and grabs his neck kind of thing. You know, it was, I, I don't know, man. I we like just it. cut up our girlfriend with a chainsaw. Does that sound <laughs> fine? Does that sound fine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I really like this idea of a mirror reflection because he's so vain. It comes out and it strangles him. And then yeah. it just, it goes right to him being strangled. And then he's like kind of pulled into the mirror, but then it just kind of cuts away. And we see that it must've been some kind of, there's some kind of crazy activity going on in the heart monitor. Um, but the brain monitor is dead. So they, they switched it on us before it was her heart monitor dropped and her brain activity went through the roof. Now her brain activity is dropping and her heart monitor is going through the roof. Um, <laughs> so apparently she's still alive, but she's brain dead now and the machines are keeping her alive. So it's because her soul is gone and their body is being kept alive. I, I guess, I don't know. They don't explain this to me and they literally have corrugated pipe being led up to her to breathe <laughs> into a smaller <laughs> tube that is clearly just duct taped together. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the whole thing, too. It's like, again, just the, the the quality of this hospital, because, you know, there's been no activity on the screens for a while. And I'm pretty sure that any normal hospital just doesn't leave a dead body laying there for, I don't know, a day and a half hooked up to everything. <laughs> but then again, this is not the best hospital that I've seen. So <laughs> <laughs> this is like if Garth Marenghi's Dark Place Hospital were in an actual film, like like if you right. got a film length version of that hospital, but like done with better directing and writing, you know, like it's that same kind of ludicrous out there, completely possessed, <laughs> weird hell hospital. I had serious Silent Hill vibes the entire time we were in this God. hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, I love the fact of, again, the, the nurse is so terrible, but the doc comes in and she's like, she's trying to explain to the doc. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, 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 she, she was had no heartbeat and no activity, but now there's some activity. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, I got to go for a smoke break. Let me know if anything changes. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah. Yeah. This is that whole emotional <laughs> sequence. I think that actual dialogue might actually be in our second clip. <laughs> What's happening, doctor? I don't understand. Readings are crazy. You're right. They don't make sense. Pulse rates increased. Skin circulation dilated. It's like she was experiencing some violent emotion or something, but there's... There's no brain activity. Obviously. She's in a coma. Exactly. How does a young girl who's brain dead experience a violent emotion? Let me know if anything changes. I'm afraid. I had to put that coda at the end where she says, I'm afraid. <laughs> Yeah, everybody's already left, so nobody cares, right? 
<laughs> yeah, he's like, let's give it the weekend and see if she finally just fucking dies. She's yeah. probably got some fucking death in her head anyway. Maybe it'll just finally right. make it happen. And the doctor's like, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Just tell me something changes. I'm going to go outside and smoke, <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. In the cinema psyops tradition, that is actually the end of our 20 minutes. Now, we've said mostly what I think we need to say, but I do have a question for you at this point because I, I need to know very seriously what the fuck is going on in this movie, Ricky. <laughs> Well, it's pretty much like you said a while ago. I mean, I think Fulci took the idea of several different movies and just mashed them together. And this is kind of what you're getting here, man. Uh, Low budget. Let's crank it out real fast. Uh, I'm trying to think, what does this line up with as far as when this came out? Was there Uh, something hot on, on the scenes at the time that this was kind of a knockoff of? No, I don't think it's necessarily that because I don't think that's how Fulci worked. I think he just took pieces of things that he liked and he made collage films from the pieces of things that yeah. he liked. I mean, he, he was that's definitely... That's what it feels like. He was definitely doing collages these days where he's throwing different things together and just kind of seeing what the finished product looks like. I mean, that's basically what Cat in the Brain was. It was a bunch of TV stuff that he oh, did, yeah. all edited together to make a feature-length film, and that's around this time. Uh, Demonia, which is very yeah. much like feels very much like this where it kind of jumps around a little bit and you're a little disoriented and that's very much like supernatural and ethereal this is at least grounded by taking place mostly in the girls school you know what i mean like you're given at least that whereas demonia which is from around this time and just a little secret to everybody out there we're going to be getting to that one pretty soon um (laughs) demonia (laughs) is Demonia is even more confusing because they're in these underground catacombs and you have no fucking clue where you're at. It's like yeah, uh, yeah. Bruno Mattei's The Other Hell, where you spend so much time down underground, <laughs> you're confused and scared the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Yeah, I mean, it's just, again, at least this does kind of keep you based in the same area all the time. So even the earlier Fulci stuff, it would kind of just drift off into other areas that kind of made you go, yeah, I don't know what's happening, but I like it. Uh, oh yeah, like it, but Gates it, of Hell is very much in that yeah. collage oh, yeah. vein where he's just throwing Absolutely. different images and ideas at you. But I, I think yeah. because the effects were done by Civiletti, I think, or whatever at the time, and he is right. unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and and just the the drill press is so far oh, yeah. out there. And he just didn't have that crew, and he didn't have that budget. He didn't have that time yeah. now. But he still wanted to keep making films. And this is something that sadly happens to many filmmakers as they start to age. They almost kind of age out of the kind of money they need to do what they need to do. And especially right. workmen directors like the Italian guys usually tended to be, where they just wanted to work. They just wanted to shoot these fuckers man yeah yeah I mean, you, you can easily say this about argento as well and you know there's there's talk of him having a new one coming out and at the same time you're going yeah sounds like it makes me a little excited but at the same time i'm like yeah i don't know man after the last few you're just kind of like do I've, we really need another one you know i've seen your praying mantis and dracula I'm, i think i'm good man <laughs> i think i'm good <laughs> right can, can you just maybe producey no more directy just producey <laughs> <laughs> just producey <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's an old Colin Quinn routine um, where he says acty to Kevin Costner. No producy, yep. no righty, no directy. Acty. <laughs> I think that was after Waterworld. I think that was his review of the film. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get back into it here. Uh, the next 20 minutes start where we see Eva sitting down to breakfast, and she states that she was stood up, and they are overheard of by one of the bullies, and I am lazy, so this is one of the 12 clips, and it happens to be the third one. He was there. I could hear noises inside. Only he wouldn't answer me. Obviously, he didn't want to see you. Did you really expect the most handsome hunk of beefcake in the place was going to fall at your feet as soon as you got here? Not the most handsome hunk. The only hunk. Listen to the experts. Does anyone have a light? Not me. Me neither. I don't smoke. And don't we all know it? Here. Catch. Thanks. Hey. How did you know there was a lighter in that drawer? Everybody keeps a lighter in the drawer of their bedside table. I don't. Neither do I. Well, I do. Whose bed is this? Whose bed was it? Kathy, the maid's daughter. (laughs) Where is she? I haven't met her. She had an accident. (laughs) Fred. Fred got sick of the way she followed him around. So we got together and had a little fun. <laughs> it was a gas. It was a stupid thing to do. 
Was she really the maid's daughter? Yeah, her mother's crazy Mary. You've seen her. She's... <laughs> it was nothing to laugh about. You didn't have to share a room with her. You should have been grateful. You always had the cleanest room in school. <laughs> it was worth it. You seem to have forgotten that class. Oh, I remember. <laughs> As for Miss Jones, not only did that old bitch admit her to the college, she gave her to me as a roommate. You're all heart. Thanks. Why didn't you share your room with her? <laughs> Can't you just see Jenny and Kathy sharing a room? A you had a spare bed. <laughs> Jenny was waiting for me to share her room. <laughs> so I got the maid's daughter. With her greasy hair and her garlic breath. <laughs> garlic? Maybe she's a vampire. Oh, no. Not if she eats garlic. <laughs> but we don't know anything about her. What about her father? What kind of guy would make love with a <laughs> like Mary? Obviously. <laughs> Another <laughs> Or worse. I don't get it. <laughs> what do you mean by worse? Who's that at this hour? I know, it's Tom, it's Tom. Oh, go, right. go, go, go. She's gonna get it. Shh. Wouldn't mind staying. She's the lucky the one. <laughs> Let's go. And I go to bed alone. Okay, the coast is clear. Listen, Virginia, what did you mean by worse? I don't know. It's just that every Friday night, Miss Jones locks herself in her room with Miss Fitzpatrick. And Mary. I've heard some really weird noises in there. Today's Friday. I know. <gasps> Okay, so during the clip, we actually do see Mary's red shot in the dark slash ultimate sin eyes, whichever one I'm wrong and or right about. <laughs> She's looking in and she actually seems to be hearing every awful thing the girls have to say about Mary and her daughter. And they pretty much almost killed their daughter. And there's also a very liberal use of the R word in there that I'm going to have to go in to remove on those fucking clips. <laughs> uh, that's what I get for recording those late at night and forgetting what was in there. You know, they can make fun of Crazy Mary all they want. They actually do say Crazy Mary but they're going to shit bricks when Dirty Larry shows up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they end up finding Fred's body, and we have a very gaunt-looking Fulci <laughs> pulling a Columbo cameo, yeah. is what I have written in my notes, Columbo cameo. <laughs> he very much is a detective, right? And he's wearing the, the trench coat, and like he's asking the questions. He reminded me of Peter Falk. Like, I was waiting for him to stop and then go, and one more thing, detective. <laughs> yeah. Hate to bother you, ma'am. But there's one more thing I wanted to ask. Yeah, I'm really sorry about this. <laughs> Just one more question. <laughs> the coroner that he's talking to, he's asking all these various questions to. And did I hear him right? Did he say that the guy overexerted himself to death? Yeah, had a heart attack. And I'm like, never mind the red strangulation marks on his neck. You know, it was a heart attack. <laughs> we said, I've seen this before where the guys go working out and working out, working out. And I think he thought he dropped a barbell on his neck. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But like, I don't want to give the film too much credit. But at the same time, I'm just so confused because <laughs> I still don't really know what's going on. Like, there's so many different ways that they're showing us kind of the same thing that I yeah. kind of have an idea. But at the same time, I'm just confused. <laughs> well, you know, the Fulci movie is kind of like the books you used to get where you kind of made up your own decision of which way it goes next. Next and decide choose your, your own, own ending. Hey, yeah, choose same thing adventure. here, man. Yeah, Fulci <laughs> leaves it open to where you can come up with whatever you want. Yeah, he he died by a dumbbell. Sure, why not? <laughs> he overexerted himself to death. Well, this ends up hitting the rumor mill, and it goes into a full grapevine mode where it's all across the classrooms. We actually hear a girl cry out in our fourth <laughs> clip. What's the matter, girls? <laughs> we just heard. That our gym instructor has been found dead, Miss Fitzpatrick. Dead? He had a heart attack. Silence! It's incredible. Take it easy, Virginia. Crying won't help. That's why he never answered Eva. And he just pops off. It 
was all my fault. Why? <laughs> Fred was really upset by what happened. He thought he was to blame. He even wanted to visit that little bitch in the hospital. You don't really think he died of guilt. Exactly. Now he's dead and she's still alive. Fred's dead and gone. And she's still here. <laughs> what is this? It looks disgusting. Here, Mary, I'll take that. Thanks. They're snails. Can't you see? Snails. Oh, they make my flesh creep. Eva? Snails are one of our traditional New Orleans dishes. We cook them with lots of garlic, like the French. Yeah, guess that's why Kathy always stunk of garlic. She's from New Orleans, too. She must have eaten these by the ton. <laughs> Poor girl's in a fucking coma that they fucking caused, and they're still talking shit about her at breakfast. <laughs> and lunch she and dinner. She ate those snails with lots of garlic. <laughs> She stunk. <laughs> They're horrible, horrible people. Like, I don't care what happens or if I need to understand it. I just want all of them to suffer. And the film heavily implies <laughs> that it's Kathy getting revenge. So the rest is just fucking a bonus to me. I just want to make sure that they suffer and that Kathy gets back at them because they're so fucking horrible. I just love that you've got this background music, the do 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 thing. It's like sus suspenseful. But every time it happens, it's like, how did you know there's a ladder in there? It's a freaking lighter. <laughs> it's not some kind of big miracle thing that nobody else is going to know. She could have easily just said, hey, I, yeah, I put that lighter in there a while ago. No big deal. I just love how <laughs> the music makes you think that it's this big clue. But really, it's just like, so what? You, you ate snails. That, that doesn't really make me go, oh, shit. You know? <laughs> yeah, she knows where the lighter is. Who fucking cares? She just kind of figured right. it out. You see her look at the night nightstand's drawer. She just checks it to see. I mean, what's so... Yeah. Like, like, she's just like, there was a drawer I checked it just to see because I was curious. I didn't know what was in there and it just happened to be in there. That's all she had to say. You know, they right. try to make it so intriguing and like she's trying to make an excuse where they're trying to make it seem like the girls are figuring out who it really is, right? And that she's finally right. fitting in yeah. and people like her. But <laughs> they don't pull it off. It just gets weird for no reason. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's weak. <laughs> we then see the girls after all of that laying about in a field, and it's revealed that Ava actually was born in Boston because she says she was born in Boston. Even though in our clip that I just fucking played, we just heard her fucking <laughs> talking about being born in New Orleans. So is this fucking possession? Uh, is that what we're going? Is this the new angle we're going to take? It's not like... Ava is actually just a replacement like Tulpa for the revenge of Kathy. Is she a possessed girl? Now she's getting her memories back. The film is not telling us what's going on. Yeah. It, again, you just choose your own destiny here, right? Yeah. <laughs> it does definitely enhance as confused and Ava actually is by all of this and not knowing what the hell is going on and just trying to make everyone think she's not completely insane. Like that feeling really, I can identify with it because I'm trying to understand what's happening to Ava as much as she is. Yeah, uh, really? Yeah. And slugs, man. I mean, the, the whole snails thing. Uh, really? This is the common thread. And you know why, right? You know why, why it had to be slugs? Because, you know, of what happens coming up next. <laughs> but it's just funny how that's how that's Fulci's way of getting. He, he must have been traumatized as a kid by bugs and <laughs> snails and because nobody shoots these creatures like Fulci does. Yeah, it's pretty close to being as disgusting as the maggots being blown in everyone's face in Gates of Hell. Yeah. The main yeah. difference is, other than the fact that snails are super fucking slimy, they're really not that creepy and they move super slow right. and they're actually yeah. pretty fucking vulnerable. Um, so, like, I, I have a hard time finding them threatening, but at the same right. time, like, the movie's really fucking selling it and we're not there yet, but let's, let's just go ahead and start diving in, right? <laughs> the ringleader of the prank, she goes into her room and she does find her bed coated in snail. She runs out and immediately accuses Mary. She starts screaming and then when the mistress goes to actually investigate, they're gone and yeah. the, the snails are completely disappeared and the ringleader does the smart thing. She strips her bed. She's at least looking for the snails or whatever and then she just kind of collapses onto her bed when she realizes they're not there. And then if you look up, you were talking about the poster of Yoda. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense, but a poster of Sly Stallone as Rocky <laughs> with his abs out, that makes sense to be in a teenage girl's dorm, right? With a snail something. on it. There's, There's a, snail a snail on Rocky. Yep, it's 
on his shoulder, absolutely. But at least that poster makes sense there. So their production team got that right. <laughs> Put your snail on my shoulder. <laughs> You're a very musical man, my friend. <laughs> that's pretty much I mean, mental. You know, that's mental rental, right? We just fucking sing at each other while we're doing comedy. That's, that's it. That's absolutely it. I, I love the fact of, uh, again, that she collapses on the bed. And then instantly, the next scene, it's like she just... I don't want to say she wakes up, but she she comes to and she's completely naked with with snails on her. I and think that's a thank you movie because I think she chose to go to bed sleeping naked and this is just we're waking up with her. I'm just saying the edit is like she's laying on the bed then poof, no clothes. And I've heard of waking up, you know, slutty and sticky, but yeah, you know, this is a little ridiculous. <laughs> apparently s- slugs can multiply at a rapid pace. And these slugs have superhuman strength because the girl can't even raise their one hand to knock them off of her face. I mean, her arm is just hanging out there with nothing on it, but she can't just go, hey, you got a little something there on your face. I mean, <laughs> honestly, the they snails must be crawling really all strong. over her and leaving all that goopy stuff and everything. I'm not even sure that I'm actually ready to deal with how much I enjoyed watching this scene. Um, <laughs> I have no idea how the snails apparently smothered her to death or something or she dies of terror. Yeah. I mean, like, I didn't find this threatening or scary or anything like that. And I was like, well, that's really gross because it's a lot of fucking snails and that's just nasty. And you know, yeah. but like, I don't know how they resulted in her death other than supernatural. I wonder if it's the whole, uh, you know, whatever you're most afraid of is what kills you, right? Your deepest fears. Maybe, I, maybe she was scared of slugs. I don't know. It didn't make sense because of the whole dinner scene before the lunch scene. But I'm just trying to piece it together myself of, okay, why are these things significant to these people particularly? And yeah. I don't really have an answer for that. <laughs> I don't think Fulci did either. I don't think they planned that far ahead. I think they just came up with some sequences and threw it all together as to the death. And it all took place in the school. And they just kind of freewheeled it and came up with stuff kind of on the fly as they were going. You know, that's just how he was working. (laughs) He just did what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. And they just did it. You know, like he would write the page before or something. I don't know how, but she died. The snails killed her. And then following morning, we actually see that Ava's just found staring outside of the door. And when she's asked what's wrong with her by her friend and her friend and or roommate finds that person dead. So I don't know why or what is supposed to mean other than perhaps... (laughs) Ava needs to be in proximity in order to control the snails to crush her and kill her. But they're implying that Ava was there to kill her with the snails. And apparently the the force is so strong that you can even erase a girl's name on the front door when they die. So it <laughs> just kind of magically dis- erased the name, you know? <laughs> I thought that was nice supposed little to little felty touch. Yeah, I thought that was supposed to be like a showing of the passing of time after her death, perhaps. But you're right. It I actually, doubt it. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's fucking Fulci. He's never that subtle. It's never that that implied. It's literally like um, the demon or whatever it is that's inside of her that Kathy has become that uh, has is controlling Ava has somehow made this name magically disappear. I imagine just I would love to see some conversations where the crew, when they're making a film, they just go. Lucio, it, this doesn't make any sense. He goes, it's my movie. <laughs> Row film. And that's, that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> that leads to our fifth clip. It's crazy. It's almost as if she were able to pick up on what's happened at the college. What? What's happened, doctor? One of the girls was just found suffocated. And that's not all. Yesterday morning, they found Mr. Vernon dead. Two deaths in two days. That's a bit strange. You bet it is. It's a crazy coincidence. <gasps> You call it a coincidence. Two people die, and she has violent emotions simultaneously. I'm sure she can sense it. Look, there's that strange pattern again. It's just an abstract emotion. You have a creative imagination, Peggy. I'm frightened, Doctor. Look at this girl, Peggy. She's hardly breathing. She'll probably never wake up. What are you afraid of? Her life has just begun and it's already over. You should be feeling a little compassion for her and hoping that she isn't suffering too much. They're saying that Virginia put a cushion over her face and held it there so tightly she suffocated. It's crazy. It's as if she had seen something terrifying. But what? She was alone in her room. Eva! Eva, what's wrong? Are you all right? 
Eva, what's happening? Is there anything I can do? Do you want a doctor? Okay, we're definitely angling towards possession and not, you know, spiritual tulpa, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm still a little confused. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the clip, we hear the roommate talking to Eva about the situation as to how the ringleader could have somehow, like, offed herself with her own pillow or something along those lines. And she <laughs> must have been terrified. And just this discussion sends Eva into serious convulsions. And it's really interesting the way that they tried to do that, where it's almost like they're doing a little exorcist nod or something along those lines. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, you're not supposed to get possessed erotically i mean that's <laughs> you know her jerking and stuff on the bed i'm like what did they tell her hey just act like you're hunching on somebody because that's kind of what it looks like <laughs> yeah the pelvic thrusting was uh, affecting me in a way i was not ready to deal with rick right so as goofy as that part of it is i kind of have to go back to the scene in the hospital because the whole idea of piecing it together that every time she has a brain reaction or whatever somebody's dying at the campus but this has only happened two times how i mean it's i'm not pretty a pattern sure that, until three they can't recognize it as a pattern right. until three well two, this has happened in, in a day and a half and i'm pretty sure if, if this is a college town there's a pretty large population she could be reacting to an airplane going over i mean how do you tie it into people being killed and i'm sure that's not the only people getting killed in this town at this time so i, I don't know it's, it's a it's a really far stretch of not tying it in well enough, but just saying, oh, yeah, that's what's happening. So there you go. <laughs> it's my movie. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that leap in logic ended up happening. And the nurse who was skeptical and scared is kind of the one that suggests it. And then the doctor just goes, yes, that makes logical sense. We will believe that from now on. And like right. the rest of us I'm, are just supposed to go, yeah, okay, cool, whatever. I mean, it could be a painter that fell off a ladder and died and she reacted to it. But no, no, it's got to be the girls at the college that are dying that she's reacting to. So I don't know. I yeah, mean, so for, for for the viewer, it makes sense because we're following this story. But <laughs> here's that word, logically, <laughs> which is a word you don't use in these movies. But logically, it could be anybody in the town dying. Even a ferret could die at this point and she might could react to it. Who knows? Yeah, I agree. Going from two people to immediately saying there's a pattern is completely not like a doctor and or a nurse who is supposed to be trained, which reiterates once again, stay the fuck away right. from that hospital. <laughs> Right. Oh. <laughs> All right. So the roommate asks again if Ava is okay. And Ava then knocks her roommate to the ground and begins... <laughs> Throwing the contents of her wardrobe, all of her clothing, <laughs> hangers everywhere. And then she starts violently attacking everything in like this weird upsetting storm where she's trashing the fucking room with this yellow raincoat and scaring yeah. the fucking hell out of her roommate. She's like using the hanger to bash stuff, but then she catches things with the raincoat to pull them off the wall and stuff and to drop the lamps down. And she has everything out of that room and smashed on the floor in record time. And it is actually really fucking terrifying. And that's when she drops to the bed and starts convulsing in a sexual manner. That's so true. once again, I found extremely arousing in a way I wasn't ready to deal with. Yeah, man. Eva obviously hates these clothes. and She's throwing them around and she starts kind of getting off on the curio cabinet. Then she gets on the bed and it's grind time. So there you go. I'm pretty sure this is a wholehearted 100% exorcist reference they're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of felt the same way there, too. But, you know, there you go. <laughs> it works. Hey, it this. does what it needs to, you know. It, sure. It, it, it's solidifying that Ava's not 100% in control of herself and what else is there and why is she acting so fucking violent and she needs to get the hell out of that school because something's clearly wrong with her. Yeah. Solidify is a big word for this movie, though. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor is called in and even though he's just a neurologist and he's on call as a neurologist, they somehow talk him into going out to the school to help them. Probably because it's an all girl school and this doctor's a fucking gross lech. So just deal with the fact that this guy's a fucking pig for the rest of the movie, folks, because it's right. gross. Enter Robert Anderson, MD, which stands for make out doctor. Better than medical deviant. Jesus, at least Dr. Butcher wasn't available. <laughs> <laughs> I'm determined to have your brain. 
The doctor checks in on Eva. We see that the girl in a coma senses his touch and enjoys it. Did you notice that? Like she responds yeah. positively to his touch. Uh, yeah. The doctor administers a shot and then immediately Ava comes around. So it feels like this was all a big work from our gal Kathy to make this happen with Ava so that the doctor will get to the school and then touch Ava so that she can feel it. Right. Yeah. And that's the only yeah. logical sense I can make out of this. And I know trying to make any logical sense out of Fulci is pointless at this point, but it's there. Yeah, I, I totally agree because she even does the, you know, using the attractive lady to get what she wants. Right. Again, that this she's after the doctor because she can't do it there in the hospital. Here's her chance. Which is why she jumps right on the doc and starts kissing him. And she says it's to thank the doc. He says something about that's enough to thank him for the night, even though it looks like Eva wants to bone and she's down. That's when the headmistress <laughs> comes in to quote unquote check on them because she probably realized that she was unleashing a horrible <laughs> lech on a room full of young women. <laughs> and then they cut from that to the doctor leaving the hospital and it's back to daytime. That's the end of our second 20 minutes. You have anything plot wise that you feel like we need to explain? Because I'm trying, but like I don't. Yeah, you you can't, man. I mean, that's the thing about it is the, the further you go, the just the more unfrayed that it gets when, you, you know, there's. Again, logic goes out the window. Um, it, I like, I like to use the term nightmare, even though I know it's a cliche. Sure. But like these movies, very much work on like nightmare logic, is what I always use the term for. Where it's basically oh, yeah. like it doesn't need to make sense. It just is. This is what you're being shown, and this is what is happening at this exact moment, and you just have to deal with it because you don't have enough time to deal with what just happened. 10 seconds ago and when you're having a nightmare that's what it's like it's like things just come at you and you have to deal with it and it doesn't need to make any sense like you're terrified why a mini version of your grandma's crawling up your leg screaming you never ate my cookies with a fucking knife clenched in her teeth you don't need exactly. to know why that's happening you just need to deal yeah. with the fact that you're seeing that right I think that pretty much describes a lot of the Italian cinema at this time right I mean Fulci was one of the top ones but dream dream state dream logic however you want to say it yeah, I think that pretty much nails any of this stuff. They like uh, to just paint in these like broad strokes of like these yep. moods and these templates and these feelings. And it's it's very much like just doing film as like a painting exercise. And they work in the horror mm -hmm. genre because people just throw any money they can because horror movies, in the olden days anyway, almost always made their money back and pretty yeah. much will always make their movie their money back eventually. Yeah. Uh, and that's just kind of where Fulci fit in with all this. I mean, he... He knew he was Fulci. That name kind of carried its own thing. And I still think there's a there's an idea behind these movies of trying to show you something that you haven't really seen before, even though it's very familiar territory. I kind of talked about this when I talked about cont contamination. They love the idea of alien, but they just wanted to try to do their own thing. And that's totally what I see here is taking bits and pieces like we talked about of all these great psychological thrillers and spiritual thrillers and stuff and just making a big mess of it and saying, there you go. <laughs> well, in a lot of cases, I think it's the Italian producers are usually the ones that were going to be the most ruthless where they're like, we're going to make oh, a yeah. film that's called alien two. And we're going to try and tie into the success of alien. You go shoot whatever bullshit you want. Just make sure it has to do with aliens and has got alien in the title and just fucking make it happen. And then we're going to release it. Oh, and by the way, alien has eggs. We see that in the trailer. So eggs, yep. eggs, That's and, it. eggs and people get killed by something busting out of their chest. What does alien, what does contamination do? They name themselves alien contamination and eggs somehow make people explode. Yeah, there's no really alien popping out of their chest. They just blow up because eggs egg juice gets on them so there you go that's all you need to know <laughs> right and it's it's the same thing where they're like well we need something that we need to sell like the exorcist and then they make the antichrist mm -hmm. exactly and <laughs> that's know? that's i mean it's really no different than what corman was doing with his movies as well hey oh. yeah you can you you can make a horror movie but it, it needs to be a retelling of you know othello <laughs> i mean you know that's kind of the logic behind it and i don't think this is any different well, all of those Poe adaptations, he got huge success with like the very first one. Sure. And then they yeah. started like, you know, it was like, uh, was it AIP? I think it was American International Pictures that was doing some of them. Whoever it mm -hmm. was just kept ordering more and more and more. And then he ran out of Poe stories. And then they started doing other stories and they would put a poem that Poe did. Like Conqueror Worm is technically supposed to be like a Poe adaptation that they ordered. But all it is is they did a Poe poem about the Conqueror Worm. And then it's actually like Witchfinder General, but they release it here as Conqueror right. Worm. <laughs> They, well, want, they want I'm, Vincent Price. It, they want fucking 
thing. <laughs> they, they definitely even a little went bit pop. further on, though. Even a little bit further on, though. I mean, it's, it's kind of like uh, Battle Beyond the Stars. It's seven samurai, supposedly, but in space. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's well, that's the kind of logic Star I'm Wars talking is about. Just the hidden fortress. If we really want to be honest about it, everybody's got something that's influenced <laughs> them. I think it's just the Italians just wear it right on their sleeve, and then they just say, mm-hmm. "You want to make it weird? Let's get weird." And I think that's going to lead into our third twenty minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. (laughs) All right. So the doctor is heading to his car. He senses something while trying to get into his car, turns around and runs into Ava looking at him rather sultry. And yeah, that leads to our sixth (laughs) clip. Surprised to see me? Yes, I think I am. That's great. I wanted to give you a surprise. How are you uh, healing nicely? How's my temperature? Oh. It feels fine to me. Do you find me attractive? Are you, um, having any more trouble with your nerves today? You didn't answer my question. Well, continue taking those tablets I prescribed for you. I'll do whatever you want. If you'll answer my question. Listen, Miss Gordon, I... Eva. Eva. I want you to know that, uh, that what happened the other night is... You mean the kiss? Yes, I mean the kiss. I want you to know that I'm not in the habit of kissing my patients. You aren't? How sad for them. Aren't you going to offer me a lift? I don't even know your name. The name is Anderson. Not your last name. Your first name. Robert. And there's one thing I'm going to ask you before we know each other any better. Don't call me Bob. Okay, Bob. Robert it is. We can spend the night together tomorrow. It's a holiday. Oh, lovely. Do you find her attractive? Her? She's okay. She's she's pretty. Her name is Grace. She was voted bitchiest girl of her class last year. How do you know that? I thought this was her first year here. There are no secrets in this school, believe me. And she tells everybody. If you want, I can introduce her to you. And then she can tell you. (laughs) Why would I be interested in the bitchiest girl of her class when I have the most attractive girl of all time right here beside me? (laughs) Okay, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. My lips are numb and my patients are waiting. (laughs) I had to end the clip with that, yeah. I bet you say that to all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> my lips are numb and my patients are waiting. So this is clearly a possession because uh, the Kathy possessing Ava, clearly Kathy is trying to get all the kisses in she can while she can, while she's still able to sense them through Ava. I mean, it's. I think that's what they're trying to imply here, but they're really heavy handed with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the next part, too, where Eva gets out of the car and <laughs> walks over and Grace is sitting there. And that awkward moment there where she just goes, hi, Grace. And then nothing happens for like 35 seconds. It's almost like you hear somebody go, uh, line? (laughs) Oh, never mind. (laughs) Just walk off. I mean, it's just like, wow, what an awkward, I don't know. It's like something's missing there, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be this very cold exchange between the two of them, I believe, where Ava's trying to give Grace a chance to not be such a fucking pain in the ass. And Grace is just like, fuck off, and then walks away. And as that's happening, we actually do see a flashback of Grace laughing about the prank and making fun of Kathy. And it's pretty fucking awful. Grace was a pretty yeah. key component of all the horrible things and pretty mm-hmm. much was pushing people to do the chasing. And we actually see her hanging out of like the lead vehicle hooping and hollering and yelling at poor oh, Kathy yeah. while they're running. I think that's what they were implying, right? Yeah, that's so, what I got out of it. Well, they cut away from that, and then we see that the students are touring an art museum. Grace pauses and stares up at a ceiling. She seems to be extremely disoriented, and then she starts lagging behind her classmates. Ava then helps her up to the top of the stairs, and then they cut to two van loads of girls unloading at the school after their tour to the art museum. That was really weird. Kind of bizarre. <laughs> I know it. But like they're setting up something else that we didn't realize until later, but like I think they should have made it more obvious what was happening as to why that was going on but it turns out grace apparently lost her earring somewhere during the tour they begin to look for them and ava's sitting there smoking a cigarette which we haven't seen her do before so this is yet again something that kathy wants to try out before she has to pass on apparently right is smoking a cig Um, gotta have a drag And then Ava tells her that when she was helping her at the top of the stairs, she had only seen just one and she thought it was a cute look and that was just something that she was going for, which is very facetious and seems kind of bitchy in her own right, the way that Ava says it. Uh Somehow she talks Grace into going back to the art museum with her and because Ava's like, well, what if you actually dropped it there? Because they go searching for the van and it's not there. She's like, you must have dropped it then because that's when I saw that you only had one. So it has to be back at the museum. A lot of what Ava slash Kathy's plans for these murders are in a lot of fucking just coincidence and they don't make a lot of sense but that's also a 90s Fulci movie so we're we're here where yeah. we are we're at so <laughs> well there is the scene where they show eva reach in her pocket and she's got the other earring in her pocket so right it is a setup eva does actually have the earring that was my next note but you, you beat me to it ah, that's totally fine sorry <laughs> it's all right it's cool as long as the information gets to the people that are listening that's all that matters it doesn't matter who says it <laughs> all right so we then see eva and grace sneaking back into the museum together looking for grace's earring eva says that it's time for them to split up walks up a staircase and then we just kind of see her cross dissolve into disappearing like the name did before on screen so yep. now i'm back to wondering if ava's a ghost tulpa thing kind of like in the <laughs> wraith right that's supposed yep. to represent kathy but somehow yeah it's very much like the wraith maybe she's a wraith maybe ah, eva is go. a kathy wraith right is that what's going on i don't fucking know i, I can't tell man i'm confused <laughs> well, we're missing the car if that's the point <laughs> Grace walks through the museum calling out for Ava. She's echo locating is how I like to put it. Anytime you just start shouting names and in a location you're not supposed to be, you're pretty much telling people where you are. Right. <laughs> She gets to that same painting that was disorienting her before, and she's standing at the top of the stairs once again. She looks up and sees an actual hand that falls from the painting, and then a bunch of blood starts dripping out of the painting from the ceiling onto her. Yeah. And if you look, it looks like there's like blood flowing and oozing between the little like uh, weaves of the canvas, which is really kind of cool. And yeah, that paralyzes her with fear. And you just see more blood and more blood and more blood just keeps dripping down. And it's almost like she is having some kind of a hallucination because then it cuts and she's fine. And then she starts to go looking for Eva again, and she's freaking out. And then she starts wandering through the museum a little bit more. She's by herself. This stuff is all creepy. The door slamming behind her. She's trapped in all these dark corridors, all the statues around her. And then when the door shuts and locks her in, she's in this weird wing or ward of the museum where everything's covered with sheets. It must not be open just yet, and they don't mind our dust during construction or whatever. Maybe they're just trying to protect the glass from dust at night when people aren't there after they're cleaned. But then the sheets just blow off the exhibits. And it's revealing all of these like decayed, mummified pieces of bodies or various skulls and things like that that are stacked up, which Grace being Grace, she gets startled even further, right? All right. Then Ava calls out, or at least we think it's Ava, but then it turns out that it's actually Kathy who's calling out Grace's name. She fixates on a specific statue that's holding up a severed head. That same head transforms into Kathy's coma-ridden face. Yeah. <laughs> it's a decent-looking severed head effect. I thought that was really not, cool. Not bad at all, yeah. This and also, I have to admit, this, this, that's the most kick-ass 3D poster I think I've ever seen either, because, you know, the ones we grew up with, you you might see a lion or a ship on the ocean, but no, man, <laughs> this thing, you got arms flying out of it, blood coming out of a baby's head, poured down on your face. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's my kind of art, Ricky. It's my fucking kind of art. <laughs> 
so the severed head transforming into Kathy's face, it terrifies Grace even further as it should. She then starts hallucinating a snake at the feet of this statue. It turns out that it's a large python, but for some reason it's making a rattling noise as if it's a rattlesnake. Did you hear it? Oh, yeah. It's okay. faulty logic, man. Grace seems to be affected by what we would later learn from Argento in the Stendhal syndrome is, in fact, the Stendhal syndrome, which is right. a term for someone who gets so engrossed in art that they start literally experiencing what's in the painting as if it's real around them. Yeah, I thought the exact same thing when this scene was happening. I was like, this is very much Stendhal syndrome. Yeah, she's totally getting sucked into the artwork and like the statuary and all of that kind of stuff. And it seems like maybe Fulci and uh, Argento were kind of just toying around with some of the same ideas. They definitely had paths that they crossed in various uh, various forms. And I don't remember when Stendhal Syndrome was made, but I think it was after this. It's, yeah, pretty close to the same time. Maybe a few years difference, a couple of years difference, I think. It is a very, very rough and hard Ooh. to watch film. It gets brutal in parts, and I can't believe yeah. that a father and daughter team were able to make yeah. that together that way. I to- totally agree, man. That was the first time I saw it, I was like, how? How is this even possible? You know, how can you be, oh, no, this is fine for my daughter to be in these situations? Yeah. <laughs> well, they cut from this Stendhal syndrome type scene of the art affecting her to see Kathy sitting there in a coma. Her eyes shoot open and that startles the nurse. And mm-hmm. then the large statue of a man attacks Grace. It's almost like she needed to power up by opening her eyes at the hospital. Yeah, she pulled a Patrick on that one. Yep, because that's what Patrick would do. He would open his eyes and that's when he was using his power and bad shit would yes, happen. Yes, sir. He'd yep. open it and open his eyes and that, that unibrow would be shining and bang. <laughs> <laughs> they cut back to the hospital. The nurse is keeping an eye on Kathy as she's there in her coma. She notices activity going through the roof once again, but it seems even more severe than we've ever seen before in the previous parts of the film. She takes a closer look at the girl in a coma and sees within her eyes the image of the statue throttling Grace to death. And then her eyes close again. And then the doctor comes in. Holy fucking shit. And that leads to our seventh <laughs> clip. <laughs> well, Dr. She... statue weighing seven tons doesn't just topple over. But how could a girl weighing 110 pounds pull a seven ton statue down on herself? That's what we'd all like to know. Robert, look. This isn't the first time it's happened before. Then there's a chance she may recover. I doubt it. I'll be down in the lab. Did you go to? Not really. (laughs) What do you mean, not really? Your roommate told me that she saw both of you leave at nine o'clock. And also that when you came back, you were alone at midnight. What happened was Grace lost an earring in the museum and she wanted me to go back with her to look for it. But it was so dark inside that I was afraid. And I let her go in alone. Then I heard the screams. It was Grace. She screamed and screamed. I shouldn't have left her alone. It wasn't your fault, Miss Gordon. Now, you'll have to pull yourself together. I understand what a terrifying experience you've suffered, but try to control yourself. And above all, don't feel guilty. Quite right. Yes, we wouldn't want you to have a relapse when you've made such a fine recovery from your recent illness. Go back to your room now and try to get some rest. You needn't attend classes today. I'll have a word with Miss Jones. I am in perfectly good health. This is nothing. I'm Eva Gordon from Boston, Massachusetts.
angry with me? What have I done? You understand, don't you? I must think of the reputation of the college. The girl comes from one of the best families in Boston. But she has become emotionally unstable and needs to be under the care of a doctor. Huh. Since you are familiar with her history, won't you do it? Say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. At the end of the clip, we see that the girl in the car is giggling and happy about this outcome, as well as Ava, whom pounces on the doctor when she is told this by him. The roommate really seems turned off by having someone dry fuck in front of her. <laughs> As you would be, apparently. The doctor is, like, really gyrating, and so is Ava. Like, they're really getting after it, and, like, their tongues are firmly down each other's throat. It's really fucking gross and inappropriate, and they're standing in a fucking doorway where anyone can see them. And what the fuck? Why is anybody letting this doctor near this girl? That's right. Make out doctor. Robert Anderson. (laughs) The entire time, though, because he's fucking gross, he's looking at the roommate, wondering what's going on with her. And this makes Ava either force him to continue kissing her or do even more shit to try and get attention. And it becomes even more gross. So the doctor is leching on one fucking girl who may or may not be underage, depending upon what age these girls are supposed to be, if it's a college or a high school. And he's also leching on another girl while making out with another. That's so fucking gross. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't know what what, what I thought of that scene either, because I almost thought that he was like, hey, maybe... Maybe we should just go to a different room because this is kind of weird. But, you know, somebody standing here gawking at us. I mean, I'm into this, but, you know, at the same time. He was giving her the googly eyes, though. He really was. I mean, (laughs) he was really giving her the googly eyes. He then starts asking a large number of questions about um, Ava's whole history, um, what's going on with the breakdown, how she and Kathy may be linked, and the doctor's even trying to sort of like understand why this seems to be occurring. For some odd reason, Ava and Kathy are definitely linked as far as he can tell, because there's certain things that only Kathy would happen to know about the uh, escargot and, you know, all of that kind of weird, like, garlicky snails in Louisiana when Ava's definitely not from Louisiana. She was supposed to be born in Boston. So how much of Ava have we actually seen? Is this all Kathy? We don't know. The doctor doesn't even know. (laughs) He's a better investigator than he is a doctor, so. Yeah, he's at least getting to the center of the information. The only problem is that he's also getting to the center of Ava because all Ava wants to do is just fuck. And that's (laughs) That's it. That's it. She's either making out or fucking or wanting to make out on the way to fucking or making out after fucking or making out during fucking. But either way, she just wants to fuck. And that's it. She's even just kind of like uh, just going after it and throwing herself at him to the point where the doctor drops lines like, not now my lips are numb. Like, (laughs) And I've already kind of talked about the implication on whether or not she's an underage girl. If she is, this is really fucking disgusting. And if she's not, it's still really fucking gross because he's supposed to be a doctor. She's supposed to be under his care. And there's got to be something against like some kind of a violation of some kind of oath or ethics or something with this. Ah, I don't know, man. Hard call. It's, well, it, it does. It does come down to whatever age group they're supposed to be. But being that they're college age, man, I mean, I don't know. I, it, I don't think they're high school at all. I mean, I I think they're more. You know, it's a finishing school, and they're after high school. Let's. That's the right. only way I'm going to make it through this film without feeling really cringy. <laughs> I mean, I they're not going to be tra- traveling. They're not going to travel from all over to go to this one school if it's not a a, a college. So. One would hope there are boarding schools for teens too, though. <laughs> for high schools, it's awful. I don't want to think about yeah. it. So they're they're of age. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> Ava is interrupted by her roommate during one of the makeout sessions, just walking in, you know, on the scene, and she's trying to get with the doctor. Then they cut from this to the doctor staring at Kathy while she's in the coma. His somebody somehow sneaks up on him and startles him, and that leads to our eighth clip. Jesus, is your heart throb coming to see you tonight? How could she be from Boston? She doesn't even know the names of the rivers that run through town. There's something strange about that girl. She has a total recall of another person's memories. Because she is that other person. Okay, so in case we didn't get it, this orderly guy or whoever it is just comes up and is like, Look, either way, she is this other person. Just deal with it. Yeah. 
This then cuts to the doctor apparently engaging in sex with Ava. The sex quickly <laughs> turns from a sex scene to Ava consuming the flesh of the doctor. And now, no matter what, that's a thank you movie because that was sexy the way she was eating him alive. Well, it, just the fact, too, of obviously it's a fever dream kind of thing, right? Yeah, they do and, reveal that it's a, a nightmare that the doctor was having. Yeah, but I just love the fact that she's starting to like really scratch him, and then she takes that big bite, and he just lays her like, okay, that that really hurt, but you know what? I'll throw a little back teen on there. We're good to go, because this is just too hot right now. He was going to give her the one. He really was. <laughs> You're not wrong. He was totally going to give her the one. And like, yeah. she does it again. And then she like continues like, and she starts like really like almost kind of feasting on him. And that's when they reveal that yeah. it's a nightmare. And in my notes, I wrote, why can't this doctor just be fucking eaten alive? That would have been awesome. <laughs> you know what? I'll put a little Neosporin on there. We're good to go, baby. He totally was going to give her the one. Uh, after he wakes up and is clearly terrified that Eva might eat him alive, that's the best reason for him to head to the school and for us to take yet another clip. Doctor, doctor, Dr. Anderson, didn't they tell you? Tell me what? Eva's mother came to get her. She She's left the college. I'm sorry. Dr. Anderson, I tried to get you at the hospital. Good morning, Miss Jones. I came to see Miss Gordon. Uh, Jenny, thank you. And bye for now. Goodbye, Doctor. I suppose she told you. We had no other choice in this decision but that of notifying her parents. She was far too rebellious and was a serious danger to the other girls. I know you understand. Yeah, mm-hmm. Dear Robert, at last I have a chance to write to you. They took me away from the school without any warning, so there was no way to let you know. And what's worse, no way to see you. You can't imagine how depressed I am. I tried everything to persuade my parents not to do this. <laughs> this place isn't very far from Boston. It's a deluxe rest home, but it seems far more like a prison to me. The doctors say that I'm not well, but it's a lie, darling. It's just not true. And anyway, it's none of their business. If I'm sick, there's only one doctor in the world who can cure me, and that's you. You know the only way to make me better. The only good medicine for me. She's talking about that vitamin D, right? Oh, yeah. She's talking about that MD he was going to give her. <laughs> that mangled dick. That's it. <laughs> After she eats uh, him alive, anyway. Uh, I just love that the okay. only alternative is to take and put her into a you know a, a home. I mean, it's just like really. I mean, they call it a rest she, home, but like rest home is what I always uh, uh, heard referred to as like an old folks home or you know right. like a retirement home. They would call it a rest home, you know, because it sounded better. <laughs> yeah, but in, I, in, in this I just case, can't it's believe asylum, it. Right? She was so rebellious that they put her in an asylum. I mean, <laughs> right. I don't, I, that one just kind of made me go, now, wait a minute. Now, a girl possessing another girl, making out with a doctor, all these other things. I can go along with that, but I don't know. Putting her in a, in a, in a, in a ward is, I don't know. That's it a far seems, stretch. It seems excessive of a response <laughs> for the school to go to such lengths, but perhaps that was their last recourse because she was becoming increasingly violent and erratic. That's well, all I mean, my, I guess. And I, the film doesn't explain it. We just have to go with it, man. That's yeah, exactly. This, this is what we're being I, shown. This is what fucking happened. And just, we have to fucking deal with it. And this is just the movie, man. That's just how it goes. <laughs> that, I guess that's my thing is like, what did she do that was so unusual compared to the other girls that, I mean, the other girls all got together and killed a girl. <laughs> <laughs> They're not in asylums. Yeah, what did Ava do besides thrust herself yeah. around the bed in a really weird yeah. and suggestive manner and make out with her doctor? Was it the Yoda poster? Is that really what threw this thing off? It was her Yoda poster and the lighter. And from there on, it's just been a bad deal. I, I don't know. Can't figure I, it out. I'm guessing it's because she was becoming increasingly more erratic and violent. And that's the only thing that I can think of because the film doesn't bother telling us. I fill that in in my own head. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> At the end of the clip, we see that Ava and the doctor are on a movie date right after she says about that good medicine, meaning his vitamin D. 
<laughs> and they're holding hands. But in my head, I'm thinking this is probably just part of a fantasy that Ava is having, what may be happening in this letter. And then she starts to become extremely possessive. And that's definitely what was happening in the letter. She was just dreaming about the day that she could have the vitamin D again. It's hard yeah. to tell whether Ava is actually writing this or if it's Kathy that's writing this, which one or both is in love with him. What exactly is going on here? If maybe while Ava's away from the girls, she's actually Ava and not Kathy. Um, you know, is Ava starting to live her life again? I don't know. But then we see Kathy in her coma state attempting to take over Ava's mind once again. So that kind of solidifies that maybe that was Ava writing the letter. But is Kathy forcing her to write the letter? Who knows? The film's not going to explain it. Why do we even bother? Yeah. <laughs> yep. you, you never know which which person you're getting through all this. And that, that's what makes it kind of difficult because it just, again, faulty logic don't matter. <laughs> very nightmarish, very just kind of logic out the door and just take it as what you're seeing it and hope you can navigate through and survive. When we see that Kathy is attempting to take over Ava's mind once again, it appears that this is happening because they are cutting back and forth between the two of them. So we see Ava, Kathy, yeah. Ava, Kathy, once again, like they did with that flash before. So yeah. it seems like maybe she was successful because we then see Ava is sneaking out of the asylum that she was in and we heard a window break when she's leaving the facility. And that is the end of our full hour. And we have the final 30-ish, like 29, 30-ish minutes left from here. Uh, we kind of already talked about it. Do we have anything that we need to add at this point before we move on to the final piece of the film? I don't think you can. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, th there's so much right here and you're looking for that thread, right? You're like, okay, which one do we pull that even gets this thing to some sort of ending? Because now we've got the person we've been following that's wanting revenge in a mental ward trying to sneak back out and get back, writing love letters to a dude that's banging the chick that was in the room with her I, I i don't know i don't know where it's insane absolutely insane <laughs> i think the lack of clarity on what's going on and the disconnection from anything reasonable or somewhat of a through line that you can follow accentuates what poor Ava must be going through because she's in and out of reality and she must feel like she must be like schizophrenic or something where she's losing touch with reality constantly with everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, I, I, I obviously don't think that Fulci did that on purpose. But for me personally, that story and that feeling of that disorientation, the fact that the film is all over the place and it doesn't really give you any clear idea of what it is that you're seeing and you can't fully understand what's going on, it made me feel like this is what Ava would be experiencing. So when I kind of looked at it that way, I was like, all right, well, that's something that I can kind of enjoy here because like none yeah. of this has to make sense because this is Ava's brain trying to deal with all this missing time. and. Right. Uh, We're just seeing it, it externally, and you know, this is when they're jumping back and forth, and that's why it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I like that aspect of that. It's, it's almost a, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing, right? You're not in control of yourself in these certain points, and you really have no recollection of what's happening. Or it's weird because it seems like sometimes she does have a recollection, but she doesn't really know why, right? So there's all that interwoven stuff there that I don't know. It, it, it's it's not set in stone. It, it the the goalpost keeps moving on us, right? But I do like that idea of, you know, you don't think about Eva as the person because you're thinking of, you know, Kathy taking over. That's that's a good that's a good idea. I like that. Well, they hint at Ava just enough to make us kind of wonder, like, whose perspective are we seeing all of this stuff from? Because, right. like, it feels like Ava is along for the ride for all of it. But when Kathy's in control, she changes and her personality is different, obviously. But like Ava seems to be cognizant of everything that's going on, which is why her mental health seems to deteriorate even further, which would make sense. She's already had a nervous breakdown. Maybe that's why they put her back in. Maybe this triggered another one. They don't really explain it. And really, if you're confused now, folks, you better strap in because we're heading into the final 30 <laughs> minutes and it's only going to get more confusing from here. <laughs> Okay, so they cut away from what we were just discussing at the end with the facility that she's locked into that she just broke out of. And we see that Mary is cleaning the corridors and walking down the stairs of the school. And then she starts cleaning down a dark corridor. She hears her child's voice saying mommy to her and then relates to her mother how they tricked her and all the various things that happened. The film is giving us a recap in case we forgot why Kathy needs revenge right here with these little whispers. If you pay attention, you're, you're getting a little refresher course. <laughs> and then it appears like somehow Mary can see the spirit that is communicating with her. She then sees her daughter. So this is definitely a spirit and this is outside of Ava's body because Ava's on the way. So now the spirit's here. But why is Ava coming back? Never mind. Don't try to. Okay. <laughs> 
There's some additional whispering. It's really hard to make out what it is that is being said, but then Mary is somehow hearing it and she's listening and we're pretty sure that Mary is basically being updated about what we see. And then all of a sudden, Ava is standing there right in front of Mary. And so now Mary knows that Ava has been possessed and completely replaced by her daughter, Kathy. I guess is what they're saying. I don't know. That's just what we were shown. Yeah, that's kind of it too. It's like, well, does, does she actually see Kathy or does she just see Eva and, and knows that it's Kathy? So, Or is yeah. she just pretending it's Kathy because she misses her daughter and this is all Could just be some that kind too, of man. weird hallucination, right? It can, it can go any direction. Either way, Mary walks over and kisses Ava on the hand. Because that's and, what you do, you know. Right, just a way of showing love or something along those lines. I guess it's just an affectionate thing. And then we see they both have red eyes back and forth. It's Mary and Ava both have red eyes. So Mary now knows for sure that her child is possessing the body of Ava because they are both chilling out to shot in the dark, a.k.a. ultimate sin, <laughs> either or whichever one I was right or wrong about. And she seems perfectly OK with it. That's the thing about it, right? Yeah, she's obviously got some kind of power as well, which they were hinting at. That was the Suspiria stuff where the faculty of the school, that's this boarding school, is involved in some kind of weird occultic stuff that somehow gives Mary power. And Mary is apparently mentally incapacitated and doesn't speak, but is able to clean and do other things and process. And she makes vocal noises to, you know, tell people things like or just to kind of attenuate or get attention or get people to move out of her way. And yeah. now she can see that her daughter is possessing Ava or that Ava is a tulpa of Kathy, like in the Wraith. Whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. So after that, Ava notices one of the girls is sneaking off with the boy that set up Kathy, which apparently is that girl, Grace, who was voted bitchiest girl in her class. Is that right? Yeah. All right. So vengeance will now be Kathy slash Ava's. And Mary kind of knows what's going on. So we're not sure if she's down with this or not, because we just ignore Mary at that point after the other girl comes up and pops up. So we cut from that to Grace leading her would be boyfriend into her room as they try to be quiet. But then she moans very loudly when he grabs her ass. Just right. I I guess whatever. Sure. (laughs) And then we cut to our next clip. Her condition remains stable. No change. Well, this is it. My palace. Do you like it? Is this where you pass the lonely nights? Well, I don't prowl the halls all night long. If they want me, there's the phone. And if they don't, there's the bed. And I get myself some sleep. (laughs) That's all? What else? Do you mean you never had a pretty patient or a nurse on this bed? So far, no. (laughs) But I'm not a patient or a nurse. Then you qualify. Okay, so at the end of the clip, the doctor makes his move and they fall backwards onto the cot, which is not a bed, and it collapses under the weight of both of them. Funny, funny, laugh time. Funny, funny. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) The film needed to give us at least a little bit of levity, and that is the kind of humor that Fulci thinks is absolutely hilarious. Uh, I'm just going to say it again. Worst doctor ever. (laughs) I mean, you know, let's just throw everything out the window. And how about the fact that I got to talk about this real fast, but this girl trying to smoke the cigarette. (laughs) <laughs> in my mind, I see Fulci saying, uh, you need something different. You, you're you going to smoke a cigarette. She's like, I don't smoke. Well, you do now. <laughs> you will for poor this girl. shot. Yeah, poor girl. It's probably the first time she's ever tried to smoke a cigarette. And <laughs> you can see she's struggling with it, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was awkward. It was uncomfortable. And it just got weirder and weirder as the time went. <laughs> The drop back where they fall onto the bed was actually really cute and funny, and it it did actually make me laugh, but it wasn't like a guffaw moment that they were trying to make it out to because they hold on it on a while afterwards. Right. Yeah. So they can get the reaction of, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. We cut from that to see a shadow walking across the door that looks mysteriously like Kathy and or possibly Ava. We can't really tell which because every one of the girls in this movie has the same bob sort of cut to their hair. That's it. (laughs) On the other side of the door, we see the main bully girl coming out of the shower with a robe on. She asks her boyfriend if he's going to take a shower. When she goes to wake him up in the bed, she pulls the sheet away and sees that his head has been severed. Body with no head. It's just a completely headless horseman in the bed there. Yeah. Face down. It's just like, 
And, and that's, yeah, that's the, the whole part of this where she freaks after that and runs to the door. And <laughs> into the hallway, which she yeah. goes across the way to haul her for help for somebody else. And then she runs to the door and she's right back in the room. She turns around to run through the corridor. She goes to a different room. Every room she goes to yep. is that same room. And then now she can't even leave the door at the very end of it. Every time she tries to like go through a door, she's right back at the same thing. So she just stops and stares there. And then she basically works her way up to the window in fear because she's really obviously losing her mind, as you would. This is absolutely yeah. a horrifying scenario to be in. Uh, she hears something whispering when she's at the window. And then Kathy's voice says that she is waiting for her. And then we see Kathy appears in front of the Top Gun posters, just like a Kathy face, which somehow scares Carol into falling to her death. That was a pretty cool fall. That looked pretty real. Yeah. And yeah. they did a really good job. That's one of the best mannequin drops I've seen in a movie in a while in the Italian films. And it bring, and it brings up my Tom Cruise theory is, is absolutely correct. So... <laughs> he's oh, always he's always been a a psychic killer. I mean, <laughs> you think Tom Cruise has always been a psychic killer? Absolutely. Well, he has gone clear, so yeah, that's a possibility. <laughs> it it turns out that Grace's boyfriend is in fact very much alive and he gets up and starts looking for her after the fall. The noise from the fall must have like awoken him. And then he looks out and sees that she has fallen to her death. As he is leaning out the window to look, a storm shutter falls down and fucking decapitates him because of course it does. This is a faulty film. All right. <laughs> and they must have hired either Larry Bird or somebody to throw that head down there to land beside her body because it's like perfectly boop. So obviously they probably just ran it in reverse. But I thought, <laughs> wow, it's <laughs> just chunking down there. It's going to stand exactly like, you know, it's like somebody would go, oh, perfect. I could see where they might have pulled it up by a line to go up yeah. to the top from down there where it lays perfect. But the way that it reversed looks so good and it does happen all in one shot. And it yeah. is believable when the head drops from the shutter to the ground like that. You don't even question it until you said it. I didn't even think about it. But yeah, it probably was done in reverse. But it looked awesome and smooth and somewhat supernatural yeah. and weird. So it had to be reverse. It's possibly the coolest effect that you see in the movie i think uh that's just my opinion but i it, agree it with you made me, i agree with it you kind of made me look at it a couple of times ago you know that's it's really not bad yeah I, her fall to the death and then this severed head is some of the finest work in the film as far as effects and then uh in camera effects shots and stuff like that and the stunts or, mm -hmm. or whatever or dummy fall or whatever it was it looked all believable and real that's going to lead us to our pent ultimate clip i'm sorry robert don't worry about it it's this room and everything. She's lying there so helpless. And I feel it's all our fault. I don't think I should be here. It just doesn't feel right. Don't be angry with me. It's all right. I think I know what you mean. I'll drive you home, okay? No, it's better you stay. You're on duty. I'll walk back. It's not far. I love you. What? After one fuck session, she's telling him she loves him? <laughs> Amateur hour. <laughs> oh. Sitting home waiting on that phone call next time, right? Yeah. Yeah. She done fucked up. She told him way too early. Mm -hmm. He's already is saying, yep. Moving on to the next. <laughs> and clingy, so I'm gone. Yep. Yeah. All right. So at the end of the clip, Doctor walks over and turns on the monitor. He's looking at a shot of Kathy's face, and he's just kind of checking out on, on her current state or whatever it is. We cut from this to Ava's roommate sneaking around the outside of the school, and she's trying to get back into her room. Ava sees her, and we see Ava's face changes once again into Kathy's face. Then Ava's roommate sneaks back into the hospital because she ran away. <laughs> <laughs> but they just cut to her sneaking back into the hospital. We have no idea why, but she just fucking does. Just deal with it. <laughs> she gets busted by the security guard when she tries to sneak past him, and he tells her that she must wait, and then he belly aches about Anderson getting all the girls, more or less, or something along those lines. Right, yeah. Yeah, then, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole pointless 
interaction here too. It's just like, why? I mean, <laughs> they padded out the but, film by the runtime it took for him to tell her to wait yeah. for a minute. And then he says, yeah, I guess you can just head on up. If he knows you're coming anyhow, go ahead. He just lets her go after like a minute. It's just to pad out the runtime. Just yeah. exactly why that one scene lasted 35 seconds for that cold chill. Cause they needed to just pad the <laughs> runtime for 35 more seconds. My man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I feel like there's obviously some sort of edit that happened here because the, the jump from the hospital then her back to the school and then back to the hospital. It's like something had to have happened here and they just completely cut it out because it really is probably the most nonsensical thing that happens throughout this entire movie because it's like, why would you just say, I mean, what'd you do? For, forget forget something? You had to go back and get it? Or I don't know. They were running out of budget, so Fulci just randomly started pulling pages out of the script and that happened <laughs> yeah. to be one of them. Yep. Well, guess what? Now you're back at the hospital. <laughs> okay. All right, so we then see that Ava's roommate is wandering around the dark hallways in the hospital, very terrified. She hears noises and continues to try and find her way around. This stuff is actually very creepy and very Mm -hmm. cool, the way that they set it up. She starts to get even more flustered, confused, and lost the worse it gets starting to remember some of the stuff that was happening in the museum and wondering when something supernatural is about to happen to her because it's coming. You can kind of feel it. They're building that tension. She somehow wanders into an elevator once she's at the peak of being flustered, confused, lost, and scared. And the elevator slams shut on her before she can realize what it is that she just did. And then when it opens, she's in what appears to be a fucking morgue that's comprised entirely of marble. That's a super small, (laughs) super fancy marble fucking morgue. Yeah, it is, man. I was thinking the same thing. It's like, no wonder this is such a crappy hospital. They spend all the money in the morgue. (laughs) Who builds an entire morgue out of fucking marble like this? (laughs) Who does this? What a waste of budget for your hospital. You could have saved lives with that money. I mean, what is the tall man working in here? What is this? (laughs) That's what I was thinking, too. I'm like, holy shit, she just got transported into a phantasm movie. That's why I don't understand what's going on. (laughs) Now it makes total sense. So, uh, <laughs> a corpse hand falls, mimicking what we saw where the corpse fa- hand falls from the ceiling from the painting, only in this case it's a corpse's hand just falling off of the gurney thing that he's on, which is once again a giant fucking fancy marble slab <laughs> that he's laying on. <laughs> Seems very impractical to store your corpses on marble slabs in a marble room, but whatever. I'm not in charge. <laughs> <laughs> she turns around and the door to the elevator just dissolves into a solid wall. We don't see it. it just, it's gone. It disappears appears and there's just the wall left so once that dissolves now everything is definitely made out of marble right here i say which is a nod to phantasm so you beat me to it but that's the truth (laughs) (laughs) and then after that i wrote in my notes or just the nicest damn morgue that has ever been in a crappy hospital yeah Yeah, like i said it's just that's where their budget went for the hospital they hired as low as people as they could because they spent it all in this nice morgue (laughs) <laughs> well, that's where everybody's going to eventually end up because of their business plan anyway, right? Everybody's dying to get in. That's how morgues work. <laughs> <laughs> she notices a green door in the morgue. It's the only thing not made out of marble, so how could she not notice it? And she runs over to it. It's locked, and she can't open it because it's a horror movie. Of course not. Right. She hears a voice say her name, and it's sort of Ava, but it's Ava talking like Kathy. It's kind of this weird hybrid where they kind of meld their voices together with like a harmonizer. Didn't that sound yeah. like that to you as well? Like it was both yep. actresses melded together with like a harmonizer somehow? At- absolutely. Yeah, so Ava states that she doesn't seem pleased to see her. She then replies that she is, the roommate that is. Ava then says, you shouldn't be, or something along those lines. They cut from that to the doctor is talking to what appears to be the guard. So now the doctor will go looking for the girl who is missing. And this leads to our final clip. I could do anything I want with you. I could kill you in a thousand different ways. I could do anything I want with you. It's what you get for daring to try to steal his love away. You have to suffer as I did. Do you understand? You have to pay for what you did. I have an idea. Those wide, innocent eyes of yours. They will be the price for your evil ways. Before I kill you, Jenny. Jenny! 
Are you in there? Help! Help! She's going to kill me! Who's going to kill you? Jenny! Help! Jenny, what's going on in there? Jenny, answer me! Jenny! The doctor busts into the morgue just in time to have his arm slash right the fuck open as he throws it right in front of Jenny's face to protect her eyes. The resulting wound and the attack seems to snap Ava out of it just enough to have her collapse right in front of the terrified girl. But as it turns out, it may be because, as we see, Kathy's body is slowly being removed by from life support in a very violent manner where all the tubes are being removed and yanked out and dropped to the ground. Yeah. Machines are being shut down and... This obviously is limiting her ability to control Ava because she's dying and it's sort of forcing her to cross over to the other side. She's not caught in that Patrick limbo of control. Yeah, absolutely. And and the big shock here is who is unplugging her, right? Yeah, because we see more of the tubes being pulled out. They build it up, they build it up, and like they're like hinting that somebody's doing this, and they show that it's a woman. We're not sure who it is. And we then see blood dripping down on the ground. Kathy's eyes are then lovingly closed, which you kind of know who it is right there when you see that happen. But then they have her turn around, and it is, in fact, Mary. She is putting her own child at rest to stop the killing. That was really kind of an interesting little twist that they did, and I liked it. Yeah, I did too, and... and- of course, you can take that and run with it different ways, too. It's either uh, did she want to, you know, end the cycle of her going around and killing all these people just because? Or was she saying, hey, one crazy person with psychic powers is enough. I don't need you, you know, cramping my style. <laughs> You're supposed to be long gone. You know what? You've been you've been out of my life for a little bit here and I've kind of enjoyed it. So you got to go. <laughs> now i i think it's that she doesn't like what her daughter has become and she wants right. to put her daughter to rest because sure. the vengeance the vengeance should be done it should be enough and i think it's just kind of time and maybe she didn't even realize that this is where her daughter was because if she is as out of touch with reality as everybody claims that she is maybe this is just her now putting her daughter to rest the film doesn't bother to tell us but what it does do is we hear a bunch of different voices that all sound similar to kathy but aren't quite kathy thanking her mother for doing it and then ava's just laying there completely still and we are pretty sure that she's passed on we're pretty sure ava's dead Mm -hmm. so ava must have been a possession at this point because there's a body that's left behind either that or the tulpa is now a body that will also decay just like kathy's original body i don't know the movie's not going to fucking explain it but there it is it's just she's laying there she's passed on or passed out we don't even see her breathing we don't know if she's dead or not the whispering continues as we get a sole point of view as a new vision. Once again, it travels up through all of the floors like we discussed before and does the HBO vision over top of the city. It moves yeah. out over the top of the building through the night sky. Yeah, and then fade <laughs> into a lovey-dovey, touchy-feeling music. Lots of smoke in the background. They cut from that to a photo of the girls just outside the boarding school in that old-timey black-and-white photo of St. Mary's College, Boston. It is college. Yay, he's not that much of a fucking creep. Either way, it's a still frame <laughs> shot. Roll fucking credits. <laughs> Jesus Christ, what the fuck is going on in this fucking movie, Rick? <laughs> Man, it's just, uh, again, it's just all over the place. And what's weird about it, even though as bat crap crazy as it is, it's still not as crazy as movie by a long shot. I oh, mean, it's not even the craziest Italian movie I've ever seen. I mean, have you oh, seen no. a muck train for fuck's sakes? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. That movie uh, is just excessively weird. Uh, you know, uh, as strange as it is, and as it's much as let's just face it, you know, we've kind of ran it through the through the gambit here, and and but at the same time. We had fun with it, but that's how you watch a Fulci movie. He just wanted right. to entertain you, and he wanted you to have a good time. And this film fucking succeeds. It's a blast. It really is. It's so much it, fun to watch. I'm the same way, man. I, I actually like this movie. I, I mean, I wouldn't watch it on repeat a lot, but as far as what you expect out of a Fulci film, this is 110% a Fulci film. So you know what you're getting. 
if I'm going to grab a less known Fulci movie series to run a marathon of, this is going to be one of the main ones that I grab. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Because this is not one that people talk about a lot. And I can kind of see why there's a lot of things that you could probably nitpick and dislike about this film. But for the most part, the whole of this film is significantly more entertaining than the sum of its really weird, very confusing parts. Like the overall effect of the film by the end of it, I am thoroughly satisfied and I had a really fun time. And yeah. I can't tell if he meant for me to be confused and scared like the main character the entire time to enhance the feeling or if I just am that confused and scared because I just don't know what's going on. Sure. And I tell you what, there is something genuinely disturbing about the fact of you not being in some sort of control, which is a master filmmaker at work, right? Is to catch you off guard. But they just take it to a different level. I mean, uh, and it may be just a sensical thing that we have that's just different. We expect our movies to say, here's point A, here's point B, point C, and they don't do that. It's just like, hey, what happened there? I don't know. You figure it out. Yeah, yeah. There's something kind of cool about that. Yeah, it's almost like Italian filmmaking is like a memory surfacing where you don't get the whole of the story mm -hmm. and you definitely don't remember all of the details, but you get the general feeling of something bad that happened. And that's sure. the, like that's like a lot, especially Fulci's Italian horror and especially the later time Fulci Italian horror. When he stopped doing giallos and started in on a cycle like the gore fest stuff that people really love, like yeah. with Gates of Hell and the Beyond and all of that kind of stuff. And then eventually though, when he got into the 90s with this kind of stuff where he's just kind of working with all these different ideas and making these weird, crazy collages, it all just becomes these weird sort of surfaced memory feelings where you just get this general idea of what it is that's happening, but you're still not quite 100% sure. And I believe that they do use the uncertainty of what it is that you're seeing to their advantage. It keeps people like us talking about it because there's right. something about this that makes us want to keep coming back and see more. Well, because there is a substantial story inside the fever dream. There's enough anchor points of a story inside of that fever dream that you can kind of adhere to and kind of understand what's going on. But yeah. it's still so disorienting that even though you have those points, like it also tells you that that wasn't necessarily what maybe what you were seeing. Yeah, too. That's it's, true too. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I yeah. do, I, I, I admire that style of filmmaking because it's such a bold choice because when you do that, you really run the risk of having people just say no, right? They're just oh, absolutely. No. Yeah. I They're mean, like, there's, there's people that absolutely hate these films because of that same reason. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. My wife happens to be one of them. She probably would never watch this movie voluntarily. And yeah. she would probably be so confused and upset and angry at it because it just doesn't make sense. And it would just, I don't know, just get your hackles up where you feel like it's trying to fuck with you like in a bad way, you know, right. and it, it irritates some people. They don't like it. And it's that's a weird thing, too, right? Because I think about this movie and just how insane it is. But again, I grew up a fan of these films. I know what I'm getting when I get a Fulci film, but I'm the same guy that walked out of a theater pissed off at Scream 2 because of the reveal at the end. And I'm like, that upsets me. But watching a crazy movie where I don't know if the killer was possessing somebody or just using him as a vessel or, or whatever happened, I'm okay with. Uh, <laughs> it's just weird how you can, I don't know. It's, it's all about how it hits you, I guess. Well, and sometimes a reaction to a film, if if a film like, for instance, in Scream 2, where it goes all the way through and it's trying to set something up and then the big reveal of the, the who the killer actually is or, you know, the murder mystery reveal, whenever right. you do a big reveal twist like that, you really, really are taking even huger risks. Whereas sure. Fulci's just throwing a bunch of shit at you to see what sticks yeah. to the wall and grosses you out, you know, yeah. like that's there literally is... what he's doing. He's painting in broad strokes to tell you the same story. Girl gets revenge while in a coma. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the meat potatoes of the whole thing now what else happens that's up to you right <laughs> right <laughs> but i i don't know i would much rather see an artist or filmmaker if you will but i'm, I'm using the, the painting as a metaphor here because it is very much you know um like well uh, art art artwork is in collages and things like that but like when an, when an artist is actually doing some type of a medium and they're working with these various pieces and they're trying to get an overall aesthetic or mood or feeling or invoke something in a person they're not really concerned about the details of what's going into every Absolutely. little piece of it they want the overall effect and they just want to make sure that they're driving that point home and again i said that before about the italian film 
filmmakers, but that very much it. so I get that sense in this film. Like, while we may not know yep. why that shit is there, I'm sure Fulci has a reason why he put it there, and I'm pretty yep. sure it was pretty deliberate, and I may give him shit, and I may joke about how it makes no sense and they just didn't care, but that clearly is not the case. It's just that this is how he's painting, is in these broader strokes, he's making these bigger collages, and it's an overall aesthetic mood and feeling that you just have to get into, and if you can't do it, then that particular art and or filmmaking in this case, it just isn't for you and that's fine. It doesn't yep. have to be for everybody. There's plenty of movies to go around for everyone. You just absolutely nailed the mystique of what these films are because they don't really care about dialogue. I mean, that's just a, a passageway to get to the things they really want to show you. And that's just a, it's such a different concept from what we're used to. So you think of, you know, uh, Tarantino, right? That's that's what drives it all along for him, even though he's such a big fan of these movies. And it's weird that he tries to combine the two because he loves the the aspect of this is art. You know, you're you're taking this. I always use the example of show me something I haven't seen before. Right. Even though they're taking and borrowing, they're still trying to show you something you haven't seen and just tell it in, in their own specific way. And that's what's always been the intriguing thing for me on these and that's what makes Italian filmmaking, which we're talking about right now, very interesting and very appealing to me is because mm. they swing for the fences as hard as they can. Absolutely. And they don't care if they strike out or not because there's always another one around the corner. And I think it's a very European filmmaking style anyway, because Euro horror is very adventurous and very oh, yeah. just out there and just so, so many different flavors of filmmaking. Whereas what we do here in America and a lot of the American films, not necessarily our horror, because our horror definitely takes way more influences abroad, especially nowadays. But like the traditional horror that we have been seeing in America before Euro horror really started making its way over here or before you get to it in the video store, like some of us were, you know, before you actually ended up renting your very first one. Uh, it's it's very controlled. It's very industrial. It's very much an industrial art where it's you have yep. to produce the results. So you do the shot as many times as it takes until you get it specifically exactly to the specifications you wrote in the script. Whereas yep. the Italians are like, smash some paint onto a canvas, call it fucking art. And if you <laughs> don't it get it, it's yep. not your fucking fault. You just yep. weren't if meant I, to get it. I mean, you think about the formula, right? I mean, think of all the movies we love, Friday the 13th, all these things, right? It's, it's formulaic, no doubt about it. There's a formula to it. And then think about, I'm going to bring it up again. Not necessarily Dr. Butcher, but Zombie Holocaust, where we're <laughs> taking a dummy and throwing it down a flight of stairs. And when it hits the ground, the arm pops off. But we leave it in the movie, right? It's great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting because a lot of those films were made for a, a kind of audience like us, like a rowdy crowd that just wants to party yeah. and have a good time. That's what those films right. were made for, because that's what they attracted over there. And that's what those theaters were for, you yeah. know. And it's so interesting that the way that that translates over here, because I mean, this entire episode has just been one rowdy party with Rick and Court, right? That's basically what it's been. That's how we've been talking about it. And we've had a good old time. And that's the atmosphere that I had when I was watching it, even though I was by myself, mm -hmm. I was like, man, this is going to be an amazing group watch. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. It, it's It's got enough stuff in there that keeps you going because you don't get so hung up on the dialogue. You really could care less what the storytelling is because you're just moving from one set piece to the other to get to the crazy bleeding out of a, you know, a piece of art. <laughs> you know, again, show me something I haven't seen before. Or at yeah. least show me in a different way. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I I, th I think we've pretty much uh, we've summed up just about everything that I can I can think to talk about with a, just the Euro horror versus American horror in general and what makes this yep. so appealing for me. I'm I am thoroughly satisfied with this conversation. Is there anything else you want to add with it? I was just going to say that I could put it right beside Manhattan Baby and watch the two of them together, and that'd be a fun filled night. Oh my god, I have not watched Manhattan Baby in a really long time, and I don't remember liking it very much, but I was a completely different person back then. I'm a lot more yeah. patient now. I think I should give that another shot. It, it's just as nonsensical. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. Like I said, we're going to be covering Demonia later on in Cinema PsyOps. Not Ricky and I, hopefully Matt and I, but if Matt right. bows out on that one for some reason, then maybe it will be Ricky and I. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> That's awesome. You're so going to steal Matt's job. And with that, we're going to end this fucking show. <laughs> 
If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. tribute for our man Ricky because I know he's a huge Journey fan and also is quite good at belting out some Steve Perry style vocals my friends Steve Perry <laughs> I, I went ahead and chose to close it out with Girl Can't Help It from Journey and that is on the Pirate Radio edit if you are listening on the main feed I am just going to use the rest of the score that was so generously included by Severin in this release of Enigma that I bought on Blu-ray which by the way looks way fucking better than it ever fucking should (laughs) (laughs) I could not believe how amazing that transfer looked they did a great job and I'm not a shill for them I'm just literally that thrilled with my purchase (laughs) (laughs) if you'd like to find the other instances where I may or may not have acted like a shill to <laughs> the various places that I have done reviews for either Severn or Vinegar Syndrome or whatever releasing company. It's legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops, our main landing and launching page where you will find all the previous 325 instances that Ooh. I tried to sell you Blu-rays without getting commission. <laughs> Or, in this case, 4K UHD for various films. Oh my god, can you imagine Enigma in 4K UHD? That would that'd be way too much. Yeah, like the, the question is, why? <laughs> yeah, the Blu-ray alone was just like so much fucking detail. It was incredible. But anyway, where you can see a lot of other fucking details that you really wish you couldn't is our Instagram feed, cinema underscore psyops. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the meme repository for all of the people's memes, which I take and then share. Because like other digital artists, we are giving it away. And you know what? Ricky does that as well. There's a lot of sharing going on with the Hail Ming. And sometimes we steal from each other even. All the time. (laughs) (laughs) You can reach me via Twitter at court underscore psyop. You know that is the hate-filled shit fest. But would you like to know it as the porn bot heaven? I can show you the way. Just follow what I'm following, baby. You'll see what I'm talking about and you'll like it a whole lot. And I'm a dirty old man at 42. <laughs> you, you can also join our Facebook group, Cinema Psyops. Our memes are also shared there. Ricky's in Cinema Psyops. He has a great time there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 seriously. I mean, I, I know we're, we're pals and all that, but as far as a podcast, man, I mean, does it really get any better than this show? I don't think so. <laughs> There's people who get paid, so they must obviously be better than this show, right? But I, I yeah. really appreciate the compliment. Thank you. That's, that's all who you know, though. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, or at least when you got started, absolutely, because the earlier you got started, the better off you are. Right, but you, you know, it's it's holding on to your dignity and sticking sticking to your guns, man. That's what I like about it. Aw, that's so sweet. You're acting like you don't have Hail Ming and a bunch of other fucking shows that kick ass right out the gate automatically and get people super excited. All right, everybody gets it. We're mega fans of each other. They know that we love each other. <laughs> I'm Court Psyops on Facebook as well with the Facebook group that we already talked about, cinema underscore psyops. You can also email me feedback, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com. Ricky, how are the folks going to be able to reach you and where can they find the new incarnation of Hail Ming? Well, Facebook's your best chance. We've got two groups. We've got just a regular open group. Then we got a closed group. Just type in Hell Ming Pow Wow. You can find us there. Of course, on Instagram, on Twitter, YouTube channel, where you can actually see the video version of our shows, which, <gasps> yeah, where you can actually see us sitting in. For you that don't know, Danny and I were sent by Ming the Merciless to destroy Earth, and we're hovering over your planet, and the only thing that's saving your asses is movies. So as long as we like the movies that we're covering, you're safe. And uh, the whole show is in the cockpit of War Rocket Ajax. And we have flybys of random people from different movies and stuff going by. So it's, it's just a lot of fun. We, we really love the movies we're talking about. But we try to just hit them hard and fast and not waste a lot of time. Nobody's interested in how smart we are or how much knowledge we have about the movies. People just want to be entertained, and that's kind of where we're coming from. Think of, if you like the movie UHF, <laughs> Hell Ming is UHF, just in podcast form. <laughs> that's the best way I can describe it. As uh, Danny always closes out your uh, particular promo that uh, I always used to love playing, just Google it, you bastages. Right. <laughs> just Google it. Well, while you're out there Googling it, you bastages, kick the fuck out of this weekend, make it your bitch. Put on your makeup, your eyes are blue enough. Tonight is special for you. You're gonna see that. How's it going, man? Let me turn my mug off here. <laughs> That's fine. I'm not recording that part of it. Uh, speaking of that, can, can you record your side for me? I, I've got it all set up. All right. So go ahead and get started and give me the three, two, one clap if you wouldn't mind, or one, two, three, whatever you prefer. So are you rolling? Yeah. I roll as soon as I'm calling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that way, like, if there's something that I don't want to include, I can always cut it out. But if it's there, I want to catch it, you know? Uh, I yeah. learned that lesson with Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, clap. All right, man. Sorry so much about that delay uh, again. Um, I should have known that when I was going to record with both Kate and Bo, it was going to go for a while. Um, but <laughs> it, it's like for their new podcast uh, that sure. they're doing together. And I'm a really big fan of it, like already. I just love the idea. And it's something I never got to do before. So I wanted to, you know, explore a more vulnerable, open side of myself, if you will. That's awesome. Yeah. So it was kind of fun to do. And I'm, I'm all jazzed up on that. And I am super fucking excited. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to record with me on such short notice for this to make sure that I don't ah. miss an episode, man. I really appreciate it. And I'm so sorry any, again any, for the wait. Anytime. I really appreciate it, man. You are so patient and awesome. And I'm just going to keep singing your praises. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about all that. I mean, that's it's, it's just what we do, man. And, and actually, I'm just like, I'm going, well, you know, any any time if Matt just wants a break and you want to keep rolling, give me a shout, man. I'll do it. <laughs> or if I want to fire Matt and just hire you full time. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but if that does happen. <laughs> you want to throw your hat in the ring if in case I ever fire Matt? You see what you Absolutely. could have, folks? You could have Ricky from Hail Ming and Court together <laughs> doing Cinema PsyOps. I mean, we've, we you know we do have mental rental going on, but it is not Cinema PsyOps. So <laughs> I, I just, I'll give you that.
All right, you can hear me okay. I want to make sure you can hear my clips. Can you hear? Yep. You hear that? <laughs> yeah, I hear it. That's actually you. I just uh, dropped the pitch so it sounds more low. But... <laughs> all right, why don't we go ahead and start the show? What do you say? I'm ready. All right, uh, here we go. Clips and all. And that's going to happen right, right after this fucking this promo. <laughs> I started doing oh, that because I, I just didn't know how to segue and I got tired of segueing. So I'm just like, and that'll happen after this fucking promo or something like that. That's just, it was the easiest way to do yeah, it. That's good. Everybody knows me for my fucking swearing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if I'm keeping you up too late and you need to cut Not it short, that, just give me a heads up. And yes. Be like, hey, man, no, I got to get No, going. man, let's roll. Is that there awesome. Server costs, let's roll. Cost for good microphones and software. I was going to say, I can drop clips and music shows, and stuff you know, like that and then just pop it in later. And you can help. Now, nah, man, you do your thing. The shows on and uh, podcast. it's more fun to let us play. It really is. <laughs> iTunes and Stitcher, just about well, you know, Johnny was big on that, too, because he liked to just get into the mood of everything. He always wanted to hear the theme song and everything. So, you know, it does help. For just two bucks a month. It makes it a whole show and it gives you an idea of what the end result's going to be. I, I totally agree with that aesthetic yeah. and that thought. Plus, if you're going to do we fake internet radio, you, you might as well do fake internet now, radio. Back to the cutting room. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is kind of a different way of doing it and fun because I'm trying to keep at where I'm at in the notes with what you're talking about at the same time to keep us in order. It's doing okay there. Yeah, that's cool. I'm having fun. Ooh, gotta go back and take those out. Jesus Christ. I gotta get better at this. I lost where I was with that joke. Holy shit. Hey, right, yeah, when okay. you talk, you start talking about Dr. Butcher, everything's off the table at that point. <laughs> yeah, you want to talk about a film with no logic or reasoning. Jesus fucking Christ. All right, here we are. Yeah. That leads to our sixth clip. <laughs> that yeah right there, that's how I got that low-pitched yeah that you heard. Three, <laughs> two, one. This then cuts to the doctor apparently engaging in sex with Ava, which seems like a huge violation of his Hippocratic Oath. I actually wrote that in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I'm obsessed with this. Not to mention possibly illegal, depending upon how old a girl is. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, I, then I make note that it's in Boston, which is in America, which would mean it's highly illegal. <laughs> and then I say, nonetheless, it's a sex scene. Nudity is involved, but it's not really a thank you movie. <laughs> I'm right. kind of upset in my notes here. Uh, that's all going to be outtakes because we already talked about that. I could do anything I want with you. I could kill you in a thousand different ways. I could do anything I want with you. Yeah, you already said that. <laughs> I feel like this needs to be a mental rental, right? This is going to be so right. much fun to do a mental rental. We'd have oh, to get yeah. a guest for this one too, though, because to somebody has to explain this shit to us. Just Google it, you bastages. Right. <laughs> Just Google it. Yeah. Well, while you're out there Googling it, you bastages, kick the fuck out of this weekend, make it your bitch. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me on, man. It's fantastic. Yeah, we're, we're clear now. That's going to be the end of the show here. Matt usually tells me when he stops recording on his side, and that's how I close out the show. So whenever you're ready. Okay. All right. I, I just clicked it. It's off. <laughs> and now I'm stopping recording.